Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Today, we're answering the question, you know, what happens when you appear to be the model Mormon family, even though there are uh, mental health, significant mental health issues within the family, um, what happens when you appear to be doing it all perfectly and you feel like you're doing everything as best as you can? How can that all kind of fall apart? And to be sure, fall apart and or in some ways eventually get better. That's kind of the that's kind of the hook. Today we have with us for part two of this two part uh, Mormon stories uh, faith journey. We have uh, Lance and Brandy Hepler. Back for part two. Hey guys. Hey. Hey. Hello. You guys, all right. Yeah, we're good. good. Yeah. How's your Thanks, vulnerability man. hangover from part one? Yeah, it's it's, it's that was, there. It's that was there. laid out there a little bit. Yeah. But, uh, so. but that's okay. It's we're okay. it's better to be vulnerable. So we're yeah. okay with that. For those who didn't join us for part one, pause this, go back and watch part one, and come back. But just to kind of recap, we talked about um, you know Lance growing up in what appeared to be the model Mormon family. Uh, in Canada and in Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. um, and how he was kind of Mr. Nephi, model Mormon, uh, high school All-American boy, uh, ending up at BYU <laughs> as a track, track athlete and uh, serving a mission in uh, South Carolina, an amazing place, right, Margie? A wonderful, amazing place. Well Excellent well state. Played, John. Excellent and, state, and, yes. uh, and then, of course... Um, in Brandy's story, she uh, was the daughter of converts to the Mormon church and how she always felt kind of not good enough and artsy and a little bit too bold of a, of a speaker, mm -hmm. you know, as a woman in the Mormon context, but how she kind of found a way to internalize that, pack it down and try to live the model Mormon woman life, which included serving a mission in England. Mm -hmm. And, and then eventually finding Lance and getting married, having three kids relatively quickly. Yeah. But then we talked about Brandy's battle with bipolar disorder mm -hmm. and uh, how she went many years untreated trying to treat a legitimate mental illness with spirituality and religion, right. yeah. which uh, Lance wasn't a fan of, I <laughs> gathered from last episode. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And uh, we talked about how they went 27 years as Orthodox and Orthoprax, devout Mormons, although we talked about how, at least in, in uh, Brandy's case, you know, cracks started to develop early on around empathy for LGBTQ youth, around Mormon exceptionalism, and anything that kind of would make life hard, oh, kind of Mormon conservative po politics and anything that would, anything about the her Mormon experience that would end up being hard for marginalized groups. Is that fair to say? I think that's a pretty fair, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And also how she was able to finally figure out a set of uh, medications that would help her treat her bipolar disorder that hyper-religiosity wasn't solving, mm -hmm. right? That's an excellent synopsis, yes. And then Lance, we got to the point where Lance was having, what, three medical offices as a dentist? Three and dental practices, yeah. Dental practices, yeah. and uh, just trying really hard to make a crud ton of money so that they can retire <laughs> in their 50s. We're and the become, victims here, all right? And become <laughs> mission president, mission president wife. Right, that, right. Yeah. That, was the, that was the plan. As it was right. thought of back then. So that's where we kind of left it. Mm -hmm. So the focus for this episode is going to be um, how it all unraveled. How does a model Mormon family or appear what appears to be a model Mormon family for 27 years how would that unravel just in the past couple of years, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just kind yeah. of starting with COVID and then after. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then we want to have a, a, a respectable portion of this part two talking about reconstruction because I think a major theme is addressing the question, do you have to be Orthodox Mormons to be happy, healthy, and to have a tight-knit, close family? Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. That's yeah, correct. I think that's yeah. huge. Yeah? Yes. Anything you want to add, Margie? No, you did great. Hmm? Excellent. You make it look easy. 
You mean with the restatement? Yeah. All right. Like you're professional or something. Yeah, like well, you've done this for 20 years or something. I mean, it's 20 crazy. years, you, hopefully I've learned a thing or two. Maybe. Some of us, not all of us. But didn't we conclude last episode that I'm just the camera switcher? That's and that right. But I mean, you that, obviously bring other things to the table, so way to go. Like intros. Exactly. Intros and camera switcher. Bravo. I'm the intro guy and the camera switcher guy. And Margie does the rest. We all know. Okay. We no, all know. You're the engine. No. Okay. So let's... So, so we ended... Let's just pick right up with how, when, when is the first significant, you, there were cracks, like with most people, Yeah, there yeah. were cracks along the way, there was kind of a slow burn as each of you were starting to feel some discomforts, mm. refer to the last episode to hear about those cracks mm. and the, maybe the seven years leading up to the full on faith crisis that, that it, you know, where you're experiencing some discomforts, but when... When's the first significant crack emerge and who does it emerge with? Let's start there. I, I uh -huh. think it would start with Blake. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think that was it. Um, so overview of your kid, recap of your kids. So we have three children. Uh, Lake is our oldest. He's, uh, he's 27. Yep. Yep. And we have Kelty. She is our middle daughter. She is 26. And Darby is our youngest. She is 22. So three kids in their 20s now, and um, yeah, that's kind of where they fit and in. And with Lake as your oldest, yes. how old was he when this first thing happened? So he was mm -hmm. leaving on his mission or going on his mm -hmm. mission. Yeah. So okay. he was 19 because it hadn't changed to 18 at that point. Yes. Yeah. So he had gone to a year of school and was... Uh, it was right about then. That they it was right about them. then. So he ended up um, being called to the Boston, Massachusetts Spanish-speaking well, mission. I think you need to say that when we were putting in his papers, we had a discussion about because he suffered from a little bit of anxiety and he had some mental health issues and saw, was, had seen a psychiatrist for it and was taking medication for it. So after you had learned to deal with, yeah, your, yeah. with your diagnosis. Yeah, he had ADD and he had a little bit of depression. And so he, I had him see my psychiatrist. This was like a year before that. So and, around what yeah. year is this? Just so I can get it on my timeline. Oh, geez. This is... <laughs> it would have been seven years ago, eight years ago. Yeah. Eight years ago. I'm not good with math. So, math is so math this is, is 2015. Right. 2000 yeah, okay. 2015 ish. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. about right. So, as we were filling out his papers, we, Lance and I even discussed do we want to share with the church that he has mental health, mental health issues, issues because that probably will affect where he's called. And, um, and didn't really, and we thought, uh, because it's not, it wasn't something that was debilitating for him. You know, it was like, well, and we discussed it and we're like, no, we, we need to be honest. We need to be truthful and we need to, and you know. Just, Full disclosure. Yeah, we decided, yeah, I mean, yeah. So we decided to put it in there. So I'll just say that. So he got called to the oh, boss. Oh, wait, yeah. and, and part of the, mm -hmm. yeah, you probably just said this, but part of the struggle is if you admit that your yes. kid's struggling. Yes. He's going to Alabama and I love Alabama. Don't get South me wrong. South Carolina. He's going to go to South, South Carolina. Carolina. That is the, always. Not the England. Debate. Right. Or not Guatemala. England, right. Or Guatemala. Or so do you be honest or do you hide it so right. your kid can get the sexy mission call? Correct. Right. And you have to wonder too, because even though you know it's inspired, you just know that there's a lot of things that are taken into consideration. Yeah. It's so, also practical. Yes. <laughs> there's a spot to fill. It has to be filled. Right. So. so if there's, you know, yeah. So we didn't, yeah, we wanted him to be seen as in the mix, if mm -hmm. you could say that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so you, but you decided at the end to be, to yeah. disclose? To disclose. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And tell him everything. So. Okay. So he was called to the Boston, Massachusetts Spanish speaking mission. Yeah, not bad. I yeah. mean, that's Harvard land. Yes, we true. love Boston, and actually. Boston. He's run the Boston Marathon. And the language. Yes. And, yep. I, and the marathon. I and honestly marathon. thought it was like the perfect call, yeah, it's to like, be honest, because he's Spanish speaking, but he's still in the States. It's a and, decent consolation. And I love yeah. Boston. So we're like, you know, it was like, that's great. Plus Larry Bird. Okay. I just, yeah, right, right. right. But you know. Danny exactly. Ainge again. Danny Ainge. Yeah, right. right. So. <laughs> So um, he goes to the MTC and he, he's, you know, the, it, back at that time they would spend six, six to weeks? eight weeks yeah, or something in the MTC where they Spanish are speaking, yeah, yeah. Yeah, immersive Spanish speaking, it's, you know, yeah. t learning the Spanish language, plus all the, the learning the gospel discussions and mm -hmm. all that. So. And really quickly, is this pre age change with Monson yes. or post age it, change? I know it was at the same time, Lance, because we discussed right it. Right around then. Don't remember. Yeah. It was right about the same time. Okay. okay. 
Yeah. So did he go at 18 or 19? He went at 19. 19. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So he went at 19, and um, he'd been in the mission home for... The MTC, you mean? MTC, pardon me. He was in MTC in Provo for three weeks? I don't know, because you didn't tell me right away. <laughs> anyway, he started having some issues because the MTC is very intensive and very focused, and it can... It can exacerbate mental health issues or struggles or anxiety if you're not prepared to do that. He wasn't eating that great either. I feel like the food that they serve is just like the food that they serve is a lot of like cafeteria style food. And we don't serve that food. And so also his digestive was having some issues because he was used to eating. I mean, that sounds super privileged, but he was used to eating, yeah, a lot more healthy food. And so that I think also contributed. It was kind of tough for him. Lake. Lake is a delight. He is a delightful kid to be around. He's he a is funny kid. He's funny and he's gregarious and he's social, but, but. he but he also um, he's very unique, open with what he shares. Yeah, he's one of those people that will tell you exactly he. he Honest to a fault. He'll tell you what he's thinking. He'll tell you what's on his mind. He's not mean in any way, though. No. He's a nice kid. He's, like, nice, a nice person. And he, he had some people. struggles those first few weeks in the MTC, and he um, started having more anxiety issues mm-hmm. yeah. and went to his uh, superiors and told them that uh, he was having issues and struggles. He's and, um, you know, he was being emotional about some things. Mm-hmm. And... Um, out of the blue, I get a phone call from Utah on my phone. I don't know what it is. I answer the phone, and it is not the. It was one of the assistants to the mission training center president, I mm-hmm. believe. Yeah. And he was he wanted to have a conversation with me about Lake. That he said Lake is struggling. He's having some issues. We decided to change his medication to something else. It's not working. <laughs> what the? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we said we changed his medication to, to something else that we thought would be more helpful. It's not working. And we've decided that we're going to send him home to get these worked out before he continues his mission. And just to spell this out, since you are a medical guy, uh, does a parent want to hear? No. What, how, does it, how does a parent experience... We've changed your kid's medication and it's not working. I, I, I was livid, to be honest with you. And I Why? told him so. Why? Because they changed this medication on my own son without consulting him or us as his parents. He was still, I guess he was 19, so I guess he was an adult. But they, they changed it of their own accord without consulting with us and at this all. This is a psychotropic medication. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And he also has a doctor of record. He yeah. had a psychiatrist that we sent them. The inform- he didn't even check with them. And check with to them to see if that would be a good it. idea, or if there was something that they could recommend. Right. Plus, I I know the track record of missionaries who are sent home. Yeah. They they rarely go back, and I didn't. And you, there is shame and and. Uh, not misunderstanding when a missionary is sent home. Why are they sent home? He's going to be sent home. Why? Because he was fooling around with his girlfriend because he was having, you know, personal morality issues or, you know, it was none of that stuff. It was, we need to get his mental health in order before we send him back out. And also knowing our son, knowing how that would affect him yeah, and how the failure for him, because he is sort of like, it would have been devastating for him. And we knew that. To the home Mormon ward, if your son gets sent home early, it's yeah. like, okay, either he has a porn and masturbation problem yeah. uh, or he had sex with his girlfriend yeah. right, didn't or was it. gay. Yeah. Yeah. And in any of those cases, probably had to have lied about it. And that's why he's getting sent home early. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, but also just to go back to the medication thing, psychotropic medications, changing them can lead to heavy suicidal ideation. Yes. So it's very significant. And hallucinations and many other things. Right. So it's very yes. significant that they made that decision, mm-hmm. period, but without consulting his doctor yeah, or, or his us. parents. Yeah. I mean, I've seen people can die by suicide exactly. over not effectively managing exactly. cha- medication changes. Yes. Right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So, 
So this is this how so tell us how you were feeling. Well, I it you know, it was a thunderbolt, you know, and this this mission president, you know, said, We've decided to do this. And I said, I told him <laughs> straight out, I am not I'm not one to like mince my words really, or you know, I, t I tell people how they, you know, the way it is. And I said, do not send him home. This is a mistake. This, this is a problem that is solvable out there and he should not be sent home. And he completely dismissed me and Lake was on a plane that well, afternoon. No, actually, remember, because I had the phone call first. See, remind me. The only thing is that Lake had, Lance had found out about it and I believe it was the Easter because then Lance is like, he wanted to call and talk to me. Um, and I can't remember why, because I said, I, because Lance told me that he was going to be sent home. And I said, now this is, they don't even know this kid. And I know this kid and you can misconstrued a lot of things. And so I said, so he said, he's going to call us. And I said, they'd already made the decision. They wouldn't even. And he said, yeah. And I said, yeah, I want to talk to him. So I, he called. And because I said to him, tell me what's going on. And he said, yeah, we had switched his, I said, why did you switch his medication without contacting us or a doctor? And he said, well, we sent him to our psychiatrist. And I said, well, you already had his information that he was having, that this was his mental state. Why would you, I mean, this isn't like a new thing. And he said, well, there was some other things. And I said, like what? And he said, well, there's a maturity issue. And I said, a maturity issue? I mean, he's older than half the kids. I said, what do, what do you mean? He said, well... There was this thing where they were, his district was putting plastic spoons, plastic forks in, in missionaries' jackets, and they thought it was funny. Like a prank. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, that is funny. What are you talking about? But I was like, okay, what? And he said, well, and then somebody put it in the, in the mission president's, in the MTC president's jacket. And I said, did Lake do that? He said, well, no, but his, but his district was doing it. I said, okay. What? I dealt with missionaries. What are you talking about? This what? The and I was year really old boys. Yeah, and I'm like they're and they were they were trying to, you know, occupy their time. And I said, I really think it's a mistake that you sent him home. This doesn't seem immature to me. This seems like a bunch of boys together like they do. And it's this whole district. Are you sending all of them home over this? And I said, and I don't like, I said, and what about the mental health thing? And he said, I said, why didn't you contact us? I was livid. And he said, well, we've handled it. And I said, well, would you reconsider sending him out, sending him home? Because I think for him, it would be devastating. It will be, it, it will be such a failure that I worry about his mental health. And he said, no, we've already decided. It was an up for discussion. And, and especially because I honestly felt like because it was me too, it was, he was, you know, well, and I mean, I couldn't say. It was like too bad. The decision's been well, made. Yeah, well, because I, you're a woman. Yes. And even questioning the immaturity situation. I mean, I tried hard not to laugh about that. And I said, well, you know, really? And he said, well, like, you know, he was so stoic. He's like, well, that's, that's, you know, these, that's a big deal. And I'm like, oh, bro. Okay, what? I can't, I can't advocate. Do you not know? I don't know. It was an issue. The, uh, it's an important distinction. Lake didn't want to come home. No. He was, he was enjoying it. He was, he was on Obviously. plan. He was, <laughs> he was doing well with it. You know, he was having some anxiety, which everybody does in a pressure cooker situation like that. It tends to magnify those things, but. In MTC's But he didn't want to come too. home. Yeah. I mean, I told you that I was close with my mission president. And one of the things is I spoke with my mission and president and um, about this situation when I found out that Lake was coming home because we came through here and I said, and I spoke to him about it and he said, um, yeah, they, they shouldn't be sending him home. I felt like I, you know, he said, the MTC is very different than the mission field. And it is, you're in this little bubble. So he's like, I don't understand why they wouldn't be able to get him to the mission field and it would, you know, because it's, I mean, it seems like worst case, they could have just called a conference call with yeah. his doctor. That's what I expected and to happen. And Absolutely. Him. And let's talk about this. Let's do a triage. Yeah. How do we get him to the place he needs? Should he come home or not? Okay. It's better that he doesn't. He doesn't yeah. want to. How do we work through this for a good outcome for everybody? Yeah. Yes. I felt like it was very clear that liability was an issue. That they really, I, me personally, the way even this guy was talking, I felt like they were more concerned that, um, they just didn't want to 
they, they said, yeah, we want to come home and deal with this. And I'm like, go home, get it yeah, fixed. We don't want we to be, back. if something happens, we don't want to be responsible, but yet you already took responsibility for his medication. So. Without the concern of yeah. how that might impact his mental health. Yeah. And the perception of him in his home. World Absolutely. And, yeah, family. So what ended up happening, Lick came home of, you know, of course, um, and he was dead focused on being able to get back to the mission field. He didn't want to be one of the missionaries that is sent home and just doesn't find a way to get back. And so he did everything he could for as long as he possibly could to get back out in the mission field. And he made it, actually. It's a hard road, I will say, because they're home. They don't want to necessarily they'll get jobs, but... Their home, we already knew that to send him home, he had a good six months. They said that that was just their standard. I think he was home for eight. Oh, yeah, he, he was home eight? for longer, but wait, let yeah. me tell you. So it's six months at minimum to fix your medication. So they put you on a new medication. You've got to see how it does for a couple months. For six months. And then, yeah. And if everything's okay, then you can go back out. Now, he went through a um, an LDS um, psychologist who and psychiatrists who knew all of the approved medications. He had to meet with his stake president all the time. He had to go to church and show up and basically, you know, and and you're not dating and you're not doing anything. And it's a really hard time because you really don't fill the days except for, you know, scripture study and, and psychologists and psychiatrists and medication. And that's what your focus is on. And then after he had done finally the six months, I will say... One other thing, though, in our stake president actually was awesome in that he came to our ward and he actually from the pulpit told our ward, I want you to know Lake is home, but I want to tell you it was for no other reason than he was struggling with mental health. I mean, he was he was great. He made it clear that it wasn't a it wasn't a morality issue why he was home. I don't know of a lot of other stake presidents that would do that. So. Um, I mean, we felt pretty lucky that he did say that. It was pretty nice. Um, but I mean, on the one hand, it's yeah. great that he said that. On the but, other hand, it's, it's like, horrific that he has to say that because what yes. does that say about everybody else? And Everybody's mm-hmm. thinking it. Yep. You're right. Yeah. And that's exactly right. I was like, geez, you know, yeah, exactly. That's that's a problem. Yeah. But um, so Lake had gone through, jumped through all these hoops. You have to do a lot to get back out. And then I believe it was after this, yeah, it was like six months he um, had been taking Ch- St. John. He, at one point, he took some St. John's wort. And that's on. it was on the list that was okay to take, but he didn't really work for him, so he stopped taking it. So they sent his papers back through. You have to send your papers back through. And the church came back and said, um, sorry, he's taken St. John's wort. He'll have to be home another six months because that is on the not approved list. What? And yeah. I went, and that was... And we were like, are you kidding me? Another six months because he took a natural. Um, it's like a herbal herb. remedy. Yes. Yeah. And, and it hadn't been on the, the list of things from the psychiatrist that, so it, it was a big deal. We had, they had to call. So luckily again, our stake presidency was, would advocate for Lake as well as the psychologist called the, they had to call the, the first presidency and said, listen, he had, he'd been on it for a short time. He's not been off. He's been off it. He hasn't been on it. And they said, but we want to make sure that he's been off it for six months before he can come out. Again, ridiculous. Why? So they advocated, advocated. Finally, it came back. And this was two months later. Finally, they said, okay, he can go. So eight months at home before he, and he was, and I even told him, Lake, you do not have to go back out. I don't like you feeling like, you feel like, he felt like a guinea pig, you know? And and this Completely ridiculous put his whole life on hold. Yeah. Yeah. So they, he got approved to go back out. Thank gosh. And to the same mission. Luckily. And he was sent back to the same mission, yeah. which is also amazing. Rare ish. But yeah. Yeah. But I don't, I guess there's a, there's a, I looked into it and there was like a small chance that if you take some medications with St. John's wort, you can have hallucinations, but they didn't seem to care about his medication prior to that. So I'm not, I'm just not clear because they, they put him on Prozac, um, which I'd had bad experiences with Prozac. So if they had even told me that that was the, what they were going to try on him, I would have said no. 
just because of my chemical reaction to it, I would have said, I would really prefer that that was not the family of drugs you went with. They obviously didn't care enough when he was there to put him on whatever, but when he was home, they were real clear that, you know, they wanted to make sure they even controlled any herbal thing. And I was like, this is, mm, that. it was hard much. for me to yeah. just like, because I felt like at the, at the end of the day, it was all just about making sure they weren't liable for something. Mm -hmm. And did you have a, did you have a sense of vulnerability sending him back yeah. out again, being like, um, don't mess with his medication, please. Well, please you know, don't have someone yeah, arbitrary Yeah, that and change. also don't send him home again. Mm -hmm. It was really torn because it's like, yeah. okay, I want him to not have this stigma of a missionary who returned early, which can, you know, mm -hmm. really hamstring some young adults in the church with their future with it. And I wanted him to have this, the experience of being able to be back out there and to finish it honorably. Well, but, yeah. The, I mean, it's, it plays on your head, even the ones that come home and they say that it's an honorable release. There's something we've seen in those kids that, yeah, but not really, not to us, but to them. Stigma. Yeah. Yes. Early, early Mormon. Yeah, even if it's a medical release, stigma. it's yeah. still, well, uh, really, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's like you couldn't do it. Yep. Yeah. It's second class Mormonism Absolutely. again. Yes. Right? You Absolutely. didn't want that for your kids. I did not want that for my kids. Yeah. And I didn't want that for Lake, for sure, because I felt like Lake already was suffering from feeling, yeah, not that way. Again, mental health makes you feel like you're just not normal. You're not as good as everybody else. Yeah. Right? The way I look on it now, he ended up going back to Boston. He served the whole rest of his mission. Yeah. Um, he was there for the entire two years. Uh, he had great experiences out there. He met some very good people. It he he still had some struggles with anxiety <sighs> and issues while he was you know. But once he was in the field, yeah. he was able to deal with it better and be okay about mm -hmm. it. Just like we thought he would be. You know. Yeah. So it all ended up. Okay. So because it ended up okay, did you encode it at the time as a crack in your faith? Yes. Or yeah, I still did. <laughs> it, I also felt like they didn't, they, they never left anything up to us. Like we knew our son and we could have told you that, but they didn't want to listen. And they, and they, it was all about what they wanted, not ever about what, what was best for him. Okay. So in your, I'm going to ask each of you this. Yeah. So in your mind, Brandy, this is one of, this was the first time where you're like, I've got a problem with the church and, and I, I feel like it's them, not me. Is that what you're saying? I, I think, I, I think I'd had lots of little cracks, but this one definitely was the one that I said, I, I also feel like they always talk about how they, you know, they want what's best for everybody else. And I felt like it was really about them protecting their organization more than it was protecting. And it was about the, about the people that were in it. Yeah. It bothered me. Okay. A lot. And and for you, Lance, how did you encode it in terms of a conscious crack in your faith? It it was for me, it was clearly like the first big crack that that the brethren are not always inspired to do the right thing. Because I felt I felt that it was a it was a mistake to send him home because he ended up just going back yeah. and it ended up being just fine and nothing else really changed except Lake lost eight months of his life, you know, put him behind where he was initially supposed to be. And so for me, my thought was, <coughs> okay, the brethren are supposed to be inspired and directed by God and, you know, they, they should know better than me and should be inspired to know what is best for Lake and his mission. And that was not the case. I get the argument though, don't you? That I, I do understand the argument, but okay. for me it was like, okay, these are inspired callings and decisions, mm -hmm. but I I knew from the first 10 seconds of the phone call mm -hmm. that no, don't do this. This is not this you're making a mistake. And I was brushed aside and said, No, we've made this decision and sent him home. And it ended up that I was right <laughs> mm. from the very beginning and they're inspired. Um, it overrid your per personal inspiration yes. on your family and stuff Correct. that you're supposed to have, yeah. right? So for me, it was like, hmm, what's, 
what's really happening here? Is everything really inspired? Are all these church leaders really inspired? Or is, are they just trying to make the same decisions that we're all trying to make mm-hmm. with their own judgment and experience? Kink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for me, that was, that, there was a moment. Yeah. Because we were conditioned to just believe that our leaders uh, talk for and with God. Right. And to give them our blind obedience. Correct. Right. And after this, and they almost, you know, harmed your son in a significant way. You're like, mm-hmm. not doing that again. Yes. Absolutely. Blindly, at least not blindly. Yeah. I think that's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Crack one. Should we go to crack two? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We could crack, do crack two. two. Crack two is the funnest. <laughs> is that the the Netflix doc? Oh, no. That, oh, yeah. That, that was huge. Yeah. That was, for me, that was. Well, so let's yeah, start okay. from what. what okay. So I, I'll say, so first of all, I will say there's a couple that led up to it, but I, my brother and I, my brother's been out, my little brother has been out of the church for a long time. He really didn't go to church from being. Since high school. Yeah. Since high school. Um, he was into sports and uh, my dad was really into sports with him. So like they, he really, he never really went. And so, um, he married a great person, not a member. She's awesome. And so he and I became very close and we would have sort of philosophical discussions and things. And he, at one point said to me, you know, there's no DNA that backs up the book of Mormon. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, now they have DNA and it doesn't really back up the book of Mormon. That was like kind of one mini little crack right there. So I started looking into that, which I never had before because I was kind of afraid to look at those things because, you know, I think we always were afraid to look at anything researchable as, as good, the internet, as good you know. Mormon people, you, you don't explore those potential anti-Mormon literature. You right. Stay the God away maker, things it. like you, you don't look at that. You, just, stuff. That's, you, you don't want to pollute your mind with it and possibly invite it in. So you just ignore that. Cause everybody's got an ax to grind, right? They have, that was how, that is the way that we think. Right. And so I was watching a, I knew that Joseph Smith was, um, inspired by the Masons. I was, I understand that. And I was watching a Netflix. I thought, Oh, I'll watch this documentary on the Masons. And the more I watched it, even I had always thought that the Masons began because they had taken a lot of the, the temple things from, um, Solomon's temple, from Solomon's temple. And in this Netflix documentary, it basically said, no, that's not true. That actually it was from Masons. <laughs> it was from, you know, and there's it, it, the one in America, there's a lot of the things that were taken, they were just basically masons. They weren't, um, it wasn't really from King Solomon's temple and that stuff. And I thought, okay, well, that's weird. And then the more I watched it, they started doing, st- started saying the phrases that uh, are in their temple or in part of their ceremony. And it was word for word, our temple ceremony. And I started, and I, it was, it kind of really hit me. And I thought, wait, what? why, why I get the, you know, if Joseph Smith was talking to God, why does God have to use the ma- the Mason ceremony? For why the, would, for the temple? Yeah, for, for the, the temple. temple. Why wouldn't he just tell Joseph Smith what the why? I, that doesn't make any sense to me. And it it was a crack. It, it there was a lot of things, but I knew that he took from it, but I didn't know it was word for word. And then I started to really sort of contemplate this and think, this does this is supposed to be a a huge thing. In our church, it's eternal marriage, right? And it's all because of these ordinances that are sacred ordinances. And Joseph Smith lifted them completely from a Masonic thing. And I just I just really thought if he talks to God, why did he need why does God need to use something that's that's Masonic, that's through another organization? Or was it, and it wasn't from King Solomon's temple. So that was another crack that hit me. And I was like, hmm. And then I started looking into that, which opened up Pandora's box. And and just for the non-Mormons who are, why are we mentioning Solomon's temple yeah. and the Masons and Joseph Smith? So basically Joseph Smith was a Mason, hmm. fact. So was his dad, yeah, so was his we brother. Knew that, yeah. And like he, he was starting to come up with a way to teach polygamy secretly, mm-hmm. but also to make sure that, you know, people knew that if they divulged the polygamy, that they would be punished for it. Right. And this is all around the time he was attending 
the Masonic Lodge in Nauvoo, Illinois, mm-hmm. and was learning about the handshakes and the signs and the penalties of being a Mason. And it's almost as if he imported that entire or major portions of the of the Masonic Temple ceremony into what has you know become the Mormon Temple Endowment ceremony, yeah. which has been handed down from then until now. And the reason why Solomon's temple comes into play here is that, um, you know, the church was able to kind of keep out of the world's and even the members' consciousness that really Joseph Smith plagiarized the Masonic ceremony into the endowment ceremony, but it's gotten out over the years. And so Mormon apologists have had to figure out, well, how do we explain this? And what they tried to do was to make the argument that one of the Old Testament prophets, Solomon, who had a temple, you know, that he he was the one to first reveal, uh, with God's help, some sort of ancient temple ceremony that then the Masons who built Solomon's temple, and I don't even know if Solomon's temple was made of brick, yeah. but anyway, somehow the... the 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 Mormon apologetic goes, and we, and I'll have Maven put in the show notes. Mm-hmm. One of my first episodes of Mormon Stories was yeah. with Greg Kearney, who is a Mason, yes. who can kind of go into this in detail. But the Mormon apologetic is is that no 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 Joseph didn't steal from the Masonic Lodge to create the temple ceremony. The Mason the Masonic Lodge stole their rituals from the Masons that descended from Solomon's temple. And so Joseph was just restoring the original temple ceremony that Solomon revealed that then the Masons corrupted. That's the apologetic. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Not only that, but that, and that's what I sort of had always learned. The problem is, is when you hear it on the TV, like I did, it was identical in my opinion to the Masonics, but like also I was that listening, ma- but, even Masons don't but even claim. The, the, even the Masons do not claim that that, that, that they came from the the King Solomon's Temple. That they, their ceremonies no. came from that. No, absolutely it came not. Came from medieval times, or yeah, after, it was basically. maybe the Templars. It, it was very. It's and that's the stuff that I was starting to reason out, and mm-hmm. and I think I'd always sort of. Uh, I'd always questioned a lot of things, uh, you know, the temple of course I went through when women veiled their faces and I went through and I did not like that. I also, I always obviously had a problem with the loud laughter thing that really bothered me. Which just got removed by the way. Oh, did Bravo, but it doesn't matter, but no, no. I mean, for our non-Mormon listeners, Oh really? Over time on the one hand, we were taught forever that this Mormon temple ceremony was a direct revelation from God to Joseph Smith and then Brigham Young. On the other hand, over time, as things have leaked out about the temple ceremony, the church has been super embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And so there, there have been milestones in the past 150 years where the church would make significant changes to the temple ceremony and somehow try and still hold that it was direct revelation, but that they're going to take out all the parts that people are making fun of or that the evangelical Christians are making fun of or that show up in the God makers or that the Masons are objecting to as being stolen from their ceremony. And that continues to this day. Literally a couple of weeks ago, they made significant changes to the temple ceremony again. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I know that from the first time that I went through the women veiling their faces where we had to put the veil over our face, it bo- the men didn't have to do anything like that. And that bothered me because I thought, wait a second, this seems very like, um, you know, Sri Lot where it's like, you know, the women have to cover their faces. And that bothered me a lot. And I thought, okay, well, I don't like that, but okay. And then also the, you know, the fact that to avoid loud, there's a point where you, you commit to not to avoid loud laughter. Well, I like to laugh and I like humor and I just didn't see how that was irreverent and it bothered me. And, um, there was a lot of things in the temple that I, I did not think correlated very well with, because we're talking about eternal marriage, right? We're talking about that this is the spot, this is the stuff that God was supposed to reveal to Joseph for us to get to the next, to get, to get to heaven, basically to get to that. And I, there was a lot of things that I didn't understand, but I felt like this was a very big smoking gun where, um, the, the origins were, were not lining up to me. So 
it, it just basically opened it up where I wanted to start really researching things and I wanted to start looking into, um, I, before that, I, I, I think I've always been a little bit more open to, I want to talk to people about other religions and things like that. And I always felt like I was really loyal to, to a moral code or to God rather than an institution. But in the back of my mind, I was maybe a little bit afraid to look into if there weren't things that weren't true, because I was afraid that if I found it wasn't true, that was going to ruin everything right? That was going to destroy my family. That was going to, I didn't want to be my, my dad in this relationship and, and one of us be in and one of us be out or yeah, it's, it's, it's that fear that you don't want to find out. But then I found like, okay, well, maybe if I, I know this doesn't sound right. Maybe if I just sort of dabble a little and yeah, maybe if I'm a little naughty. So Lance, do you remember her telling you about her problems with the Masonic Lodge in this documentary? No, she did not. Whoa. I didn't tell him. <laughs> so you're having this major crack in your Mormon faith. Your whole world's built around Mormonism and you're afraid to tell your own husband. Uh, yeah. I told him I watched a really good documentary on masonry and like, he should oh, watch that's it. Great. I'd never watched it. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, I should watch it. It's just kind of interesting. I didn't tell him what it meant to me. No, <laughs> no, because I didn't want to threat. I did. I I, first of all, I never want to be responsible, even with our kids and stuff. I never wanted to be the one responsible for somebody else to lose their faith. Even now, I don't want to be responsible for that mm -hmm. um, because it's it's a journey. It's and a so, personal journey. Yeah. And I didn't want to be the one that was like, hey, did you see this? And did you see that? And it's like, you know, I really just wanted to, it was, yeah. And so, no, I, I didn't know how he would react either. And He's always been really straight, you know, he's always been, like I said, I've always had sort of little issues that I've nitpicked and sort of, but I, you know, I didn't want to threaten my, no. So that's how he felt. <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, that's when you're not able to tell your partner, your spouse mm -hmm. of something major that's happening to you. That's a problem. Well, and that's the thing is we, I mean, we talk about everything. I feel like we we really have like a really good relationship. That would be the line. It was the spirituality thing. That was the line that I thought, yeah, no, not mm -hmm. going there. Um, and it'll come up later too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for you, that's crack too. Mm -hmm. That's not a crack for you, Lance, because you were out of the loop. I was out of the loop. <laughs> okay. Unaware. Okay. <laughs> Blissful ignorance. Yes. <laughs> All right. So what, uh, what was the next uh, major crack is... Is is Darby the next? I think Darby's crack? the next major crack. Yeah, yeah, I think for Lance there probably was some. Again, it was probably the activity issue because you were getting more into cycling and. Yeah, I I started skating. like you know we talked about this in the last episode, but I I started to kind of put my church service a little bit more at arm's length, and um and and not commit so much time to my church service because I felt like it was taking away from my family and taking away from, you know, being able to run my businesses and, and, and being able to be athletic. I mean, I, I, I race bikes now, I race bicycles and I'm involved with the cycling team and I have a cycling podcast. And so, um, I was getting involved with that and I felt a lot of, of joy and, um, just acceptance in that world. And so I started to pull away from the church. Interestingly enough, in the middle of this, um, I ended up retiring from dentistry, uh, when I was 47, which is way too young to retire. Um, but I had invested well and was able to do it and be done with that. And so suddenly we had a little bit of free time. All I had all the free time in the world. You were ready to be called as a mission president. I was ready to be called as a mission well, president. Well, that's what the stake presidency is. So the, <laughs> the stake presidency. No, but that is what happens. A lot yeah. of yeah. mission presidents are younger Mormon couples that, that financially are successful. Yeah, yes. they can and do that. And then the church says, okay, they're wealthy, right. they're successful. Yeah. Let's make it mission presence. Yes. Luckily, we were naughty enough that we really knew that we were okay. <laughs> well, they, they could tell that I had She's been. She's joking. Yeah, I'm pulling, joking. Yeah. They could tell that I had been like. I'm yeah. just keeping things. But they tried to bay. keep him in. I so, felt like that. Yeah, what they did is they um, they came to me and called me to be the um, assistant stake executive secretary. So the executive secretary for the stake presidency. So basically part of the stake presidency. 
And for never Mormons, there's wards, which are congregations, and like eight to ten wards make up a stake. So in it's like in Catholicism, a diocese. Mm-hmm. So you're becoming the assistant to the top leaders over an entire region of the Mormon Church. Yes, right. Yes, it's correct. a it's a very respectable. It is powerful kind of calling. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an ego boost to yeah. get a state calling, yeah. a little bit. But um, he came to me and says, hey, we want you to do this. And, you know, you really don't turn down callings. Um, Good, faithful Mormons don't turn down callings. You do what they ask you to do. But I told them at that moment, I said, look, we just retired. I'm going to be traveling. We're going to be driving around the country in our sprinter van and going to bike races and staying in warmer climates for part of the winter. And so I'm not really sure... Are you, did you really think through this all the way? And, and um, you know, of course their answer was yes, you are the one that the Lord has chosen to do this, which I read as you're a brilliant businessman and we want you to be part of our organization, <laughs> our little organization. want to keep your tithing mm-hmm. yes, you know, flowing. Correct. Right. Right. And potentially leverage you for your leadership. Center. Correct. Yes. Right. In and so I agreed to do it. I said, okay, I'll do it. And then that lasted only about... A year and a half because I was gone all the time. He was gone all the time. <laughs> so they, yeah. So, so were at that point, had you processed that? Were you consciously struggling with your faith at that yes. point? Yes. Yes. So we haven't gotten to that point yet. No. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's go back and get us to that point. So the year, that's a big deal to it, kind of like. It is. Yeah. Cause yeah. To, to say, I'm not sure you guys are making the right decision. Yeah. Um, yeah that, 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 that big crack happened with our daughter, Darby. So Darby's our youngest. She's 22 now. Uh, she is a delightful woman. We love being around her. People love being around her. She has this wonderful personality. She was, she was girl of the year at her high school, and she was, yeah. you know— Singer, actor, she was a leader theater, in lots of the lead, yeah, plays leader. She's yeah. like daddy's girl. A little yeah, bit. she's yeah. yeah. Well, she's yeah. Not, awesome. not, not, just like the popularity thing. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she was. I yeah, no. nothing. Yeah, no, that. I know, I know, no. But she was. She's. Yeah, people are drawn to her. They always people are drawn to her. She's well, probably leader. artistic from you, but I meant the popular thing. That's all I meant. <laughs> oh yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Her. She was definitely more like. Actually, most of our our kids were like. All of them were like him, not me. Okay, I stepped I in. I'm sorry. Maybe. Rude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She wasn't. Uh, she wasn't an outsider like me. Okay. So Darby graduated from high school in 2018, mm-hmm, and um, she got accepted. She none of our kids went to BYU. Actually, they didn't want to go to BYU. They didn't want to, or they tried to and didn't get accepted. And well, they went to BYU. Blow, I. But they she went, went to, to BYU. But they I hated it there. But that's not the same thing as BYU Provo. Yeah. But did Darby date in high school? Yes. Date boys in high school. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. Okay. Kind of. But I think it was all a show. So that's a process. We'll talk about that. Later. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah, I think she like. So were there any signs in high school? Um, no, not that we recognized. There were, there were, there was a relationship she had with a girl that that we didn't really realize what it was. Well, I asked mm. her. <laughs> But she I straight up asked her, but she but she said no. She went to prom with a girl. She went and to I prom said, with Are you going as a girl? And and yeah. And she said she said, No, no, we're just friends. And yeah, that's a whole yeah, that's a whole other like that I think that'll she, come out. She didn't want to disappoint us, of course. So <laughs> she so she was closeted in high school. And I don't Correct. and I and I was disappointed that she felt that way. Mm-hmm. I was disappointed that I didn't create a better space. That I thought, do you know what I mean? That that mm-hmm. was that was my, and so uh, yeah. So, but but we talked. We've talked about it. But that has something to do with this. So. But in high school, she was. Yeah, she was. She knew she was yeah. lesbian. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah. But she, she was closeted. Did she appear? Did she present as a faithful Mormon? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. She was. Yes. She was the the. That's uh, yeah. She was the president. She'd always the been Lord in leadership. And, uh, She'd always been in leadership. She had organized camps and they had her in the, I think seminary, yeah. all of our kids had always been very, yeah. Leadership. They were Lance. Yeah. They were definitely. Yeah. And, and um, one of her friends had like outed her to the Bishop. Yep. We didn't know this. And so the Bishop called her in to talk with her. When she was the president. When she was the, the Laurel president. president. And 
and asked her directly if she was gay, gay yeah. and she told him yes that she was. This is we didn't know this. Yeah, this was her senior year. This was her senior year in high school. And um and and she was like I don't know what to do about it. I don't know how I fit in how I church. fit into the church cuz I like being a leader and yeah. I and I'm good at being a leader. Um she'd organize camps, you know, she's she that's yeah. And our bishop, who of course they, he's they don't a wonderful get, person. He's a wonderful person. They don't get good training with how to deal with these types of issues. And he basically said well, to her Well, first she said, I want to know if there's a place for me in this church. And, and he, he said, said, Let me get back to you. <laughs> and so when he got back to her, he said, No, there is there's no really place not. for you here, is what he said. Yeah. And that kind of crushed her. She's like, there really isn't a place for me I mean, not, as not a 100%. gay woman. And of course, this was 2018. I know that things were changing in the church, but not really, nah. or we hadn't really felt that at all. So our bishop knew before we did. <laughs> a lot of people knew before we did. A lot of people knew before we but did. But I don't, I, my, she was close to her aunt and her cousin and they knew, but honestly, I never wanted anyone else to tell us this. It was hers to tell. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think I'm not very happy with the friend that went to the bishop. I mean, that wasn't really theirs to tell. And, and the bishop calling him in, I mean, honestly, in all honesty, I think that's a very personal thing and they should be able to, to say when they are, when they're ready mm -hmm. to who they want to. That's really important. Yeah. That's, they took away a little bit of power and I know our daughter's not mad about it or, but I mean, I think to, to, for that, in that instance, caused some trauma. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Also, on the one hand, I can't think of a more unchristlike thing for a religious leader, a bishop in this Mormon bishop in this case, to tell a teenage, any teenager, that there's no place for them in the church. On the yeah. one hand, that's horrific. On the other hand, it's actually true. Yeah. yeah. And in some sense, a very charitable thing to tell a kid. So that at least as heartbroken as they might be, yeah. they don't make a bunch yeah. of decisions later that are, they're going to come to regret. They'll just say, well, maybe this isn't the place for me. Right. And knowing this bishop, I and mean, we've obviously been friends, like we've known him, and he is one of the kindest people in the world. But I think he was, I feel bad for him that he had to be in that spot. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't know. Because I either. almost guarantee you, knowing him too, he's pro I wouldn't imagine that he's not thinking about that and feeling like, you know, you put him in a, this terrible spot. And what do you do, yeah. right? And so, um, and Darby, you know, understands, I mean, that part of it was sh she loves him, understands him, but yeah, it's just doesn't, they put, the church puts you in that spot. I don't think it's, <coughs> no man's going to choose that. Yeah. You of hope. course, systems, yeah. systems, not people we like yeah. to yeah. try and say. Yeah. yeah. At this point, Brandy and I still didn't know. Um, and Lively so unaware. she had, uh, Her high school graduation. Yeah. Saying. She, she graduated from high school and she, uh, got accepted to Washington state university in Eastern Washington in Pullman. Pullman. And, mm -hmm. um, so for her freshman year, we drove her down there with her stuff so that she could move, move into her, you know, apartment. And, uh, while we were there in Pullman, um, we took her to the Institute building. They have an Institute building on campus so that she knew where the Institute building was and she could know where she could go to church. And, and as a good, you know, uh, faithful priesthood holder, I wanted to give her a priesthood blessing before she, you know, before I left her for her freshman year of college. And so we, uh, we went to the Institute building so I could give her this blessing. And she said, before you do that, um, dad, I need to tell you and mom that um, I'm gay. And it kind of floored both of us because we didn't really see it coming. And um, we weren't sure what to do or how to respond because to me, at that moment in my life, that was the, that was the type of crack that could break our family apart. If I'm going to be a part of this church that promises me eternal life with my forever family, 
and now I have a daughter that's gay that doesn't fit into that plan, is all of a sudden our family not going to be forever and eternal together because one doesn't fit into the plan. And that those are the thoughts that kind of went through my head when she told us that. And I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know what to say to her. We just, I gave her the priesthood blessing and we kind of shell shocked. Well, I will say that the first thing actually that came out of his mouth is, okay, well, we still love you. And I think that was, and we're like, I mean, I feel like that's your knee jerk is like, listen, I don't want you to think this is going to change anything. We probably hadn't thought it all the way through, but the very first thing is I'm like, I don't, you know, I think both of us knew the last thing we want you to feel is that we're ashamed of you, embarrassed of you, or that, you know, I think that that's like most of our kids, anytime that they've said anything to us, definitely it's like, we still love you. We, I want you to know you love, we love you. I mean, that. Definitely, I think is, and, and we cried and we said, we still love you. We understand, you know, that, you know, we don't know how to process it, but we're like, uh, n before anything, you're still ours. We still love you. And so that's, that was kind of where, you know, we left it and then we're going to have to process it. So we didn't know what to do. We got in our truck and started driving the five hours back to Vancouver, Washington. Spoke not a word to each other for the first half hour. <laughs> Nothing. Just sat there. We didn't know what to say. We didn't know what to think. No. We were both. Yeah, kind of shell, think just shell, shell shocked. I don't think I I ever thought that I wouldn't have a child that was gay, or or I never that never came. I've never been that kind of person that thought my kids wouldn't try drinking or smoking. And I think that's probably was probably a healthy thing that I never set that bar. Even though maybe other church people do, I never wanted to be that parent that was like, no, my kid would never do that. So I think that's probably good, but we didn't talk to each other for, yeah, like first half hour. And can I tell this part yeah. of the story? I remember after a half hour, just sitting there going, oh. because t as a mom, I think you, it, your initial, at least me. And I think most moms are like, I still love you. I don't want to, I don't want this to tear us apart. You worry about your spouse because there's a lot of you know, things that, I don't know, I think men just in general, you know, but Lance, I remember Lance after half hour, he said, he looked at me and he said, I'm not losing her over this. And I just remember thinking, oh, you were never more attractive to me than just right now. Mm -hmm. Just, you are the hottest person ever. Mm -hmm. And I just I never felt more, you know, love or appreciation than I did right that then. Cause it's like, that's why you're their dad. That's why I love you because I'm so impressed with that you would come to that. And so that was, I think that was huge for our whole family because, wow, that's, that's a man, right? That's what you want is no matter what, he had the same priorities that our, our family's gonna be first. And that meant a lot to me. And so after that, that was the start of our conversation where, okay, how is this gonna look now? now what, just for those who aren't Mormon and don't understand, why would this feel like such a threat and a risk within a Mormon context to, to, to the family and, and everything and to your daughter. And according to Mormon doctrine, um, homosexuality does not fit within the gospel or well, it's a choice. Yeah. It, it's a choice. You're not born with it. Um, which we now know is not the case, you know, but, um, but within Mormon doctrine, there, 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 there is not a place for homosexuality, for to live that way. To live that way, and and you're not going to get. You shouldn't be married. You can't. You know, you, you're either going to live a celibate life, or a mixed faith marriage, or yeah. But no, you can't be. Yeah, no, you can't even orientation. be. Yeah, but yeah, mixed orientation marriage and if you want to be part of the church. So for us, it was like okay, if she really is gay, then how does that fit with the rest of our lives and with the gospel? And that was a moment for me where, okay, I need to really dig into this concept with the Mormon church and how this is, because Darby is one of the best people I know. She is one of the kindest, sweetest, most loving people that, that I know. And how does... How does a delightful person like that 
not fit into the gospel just because of her sexual orientation. And, and, and does our family fit now? Yeah, and how, how do we fit in with this? Without ostracizing her and making her feel differently too. I think that's a huge, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to be one as a family, but you have all together except this one. It's like, oh, that one. So that, that was the start of another huge crack for me personally. Like, yeah. okay, my daughter's more, my, my relationship with my daughter is more important than, 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 I hate to say this, but than what the gospel has taught me my whole life. I don't want to lose my relationship with my daughter. That, that, that is, that's, that's precious to me and more important to me than, than anything else, you know, with, with all of my kids and with my wife. I don't want to lose that. I don't want that to go away. And if, if the gospel is teaching me that the only way I can be forever with my family is by excluding her, man, that doesn't sit right. That does not sit right with me. Well, it doesn't, it really doesn't, I don't understand how that even is true with the church other than the, you know, the, their whole thing is, you know, in the next life, but it's like, well, that doesn't really make any sense either. So you think if I ostracize one person out of my faith that that's, I just, you know, out of, out of our family, that just doesn't make any sense to me where I think that was, that was a struggle for me too, where, and also the fact that the church is like, you know, your family should be your, you know, what is it? No, no other failure is worse than failure in the home. Well, that, that is no success outside yeah. the home is, yeah. But I mean, that's, whatever. that's basically, I mean, the thing is, is the church set us up. You know, I mean, basically the church is what really helped us to put every, all our eggs in our family basket. And then to say that there's this one little thing that would jeopardize that. Well, okay. So if my family's the most prior, the biggest priority, you know, you've set us up basically. So we're going to keep to that. We're going to, we're going to keep going on that path because that has shown that that does bring us joy. Yeah. Such a good point. Right. I mean, that's, we've lived mm -hmm. it. We know that this, our family's where we have the most joy. So why would we break that apart because of something that, you know, because yeah, I mean, I feel like they, you know, it, it's hand in hand. So I just, yeah I've, yeah. I've never really, in all my years, I've never really drawn this very important conclusion that you just helped me realize is the church has sabotaged itself. It's, it's created this, um, this scenario where families are all that matters, no empty chairs. You want to be with your family together forever in the eternities and 5% or more of the population <clears throat> is always going to be um, unacceptable to the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. And so it sets, it sets parents up to say, well, all right, then I got to choose if families are yeah. the most important thing and no empty chairs and my daughter's gay and the church has said that being gay is evil then I'm picking my daughter. And in that sense, the church has set up a double bind Yeah, that yeah. just forces people to choose to leave the church. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's actually, that's actually even further down the line where we'll talk about of course, this. But I got ahead yeah. of ourselves a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but that it, it's exactly right. But it's, it sets it up. Yeah, it does. It does. It's yeah. yeah. They made us, th this is a monster of their making to some degree. You know, they've, they've built us up to, to build great homes and families. And that's where our greatest joy is. Um, yet they've put a lot of stipulations on the people that can be in those and continue to do that so that it makes it, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things I really struggled with, you know, um, I, through, through Lake's experience and through uh, Darby um, coming out to us, it, it really made me self-reflect on how much I was judging my own children. Okay. Okay. If, if they're not doing the things I want them to do, mm -hmm. then I, I, then I think they're making a poor decision or a, or a bad choice. If they're, if they're associating with people that I don't think they should be associating with, then, then they're making a big mistake. And it affected how I felt and cared and loved for my own kids. And so it was kind of through this process of like becoming a little bit more 
self-aware with how I was feeling with that and how much I was judging that I realized, just stop judging your kids. I just need to stop judging them. Let the, okay, I have, we've taught them good principles, but guess what? They, they're adults now. They get to make their own decisions. They get to decide their own fate. And that is not on us anymore because they're now adults and get to make their own decision. And as soon as I came to that realization that I need to stop judging them, the relationship that we had with them just blossomed. It just got so much better because I quit judging them so much and I just got to love them for who they were as people. And I like the people that they are. Which is true like everything, And they felt less pressure from us Mm -hmm. too. They didn't feel like they had to be, I don't have to be pleasing mom and dad. I get to make the decision which I think is right. And it lifts a lot of weight. Yeah. It did. I think it lifts a lot. I mean, just even with friends, if you think about it, a lot of your friends, you have friends, they may not do exactly what you want them to do or exactly as you, you know, maybe you think, but man, when you start judging and, and the judges that, you know, that, and what you're judging them on, I mean, it just lifts you up and you can just be friends with them. You can enjoy what the good that they bring. And, uh, and that's a hard process because the church has almost given us a little bit of a, before that. They give parents that okay to judge, right? If you're not going to live by my rules, you're not going to live under my house. You know, you're not going to be under my roof if you're not going to. And I don't want to judge others because I realize maybe that's their, you know, that's their thing. But I'm just saying it it really, um, I feel like a lot of times, uh, you know, even lessons and things are really about, um, you know, it's like I said before, kids are a reflection of their parents and the parenting. And so it just seems like it extends that way. And it's like, you know, if we, really look at it as a relationship rather. Um, it's nice to not have those restrictions. Yeah. I mean, especially where we're talking about, you know, sin and gay. I just think that's really, those restrictions and those things should not be together. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when it really like, you know, I mean, we've talked about that before, you know, if you asked, you know, if you asked me to start becoming gay, right? It would feel wrong. And, and I wouldn't be, I could not per, be happy because it doesn't feel normal. It doesn't feel right. But that's what we're asking our, you know, that's what we're asking our gay children to do, or, you know, even gay people that was, that's what you're asking them to do is to go against something that feels safe and normal to them. And, um, I just don't think that's, I have a hard time with that, the, with showing that that's the God too, that is, cause I just, yeah. That's a whole other issue, but but yeah. for our daughter and for our family, preserving our family was number one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so one of your kids, you, an empty chair develops in the yes. eternities for mm-hmm. in your Mormon vision, in your Mormon plan that you had been working for for 20 whatever years. Yeah. All of a sudden, Darby becomes your empty chair in the celestial kingdom. Yes. Supposedly, yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. According to the church. Right. So that became one of those issues where I don't understand this. I don't know how it all fits. And so what were we taught to do by, I don't know who it was, but you put it D- on the doubt shelf. Your doubts. What's that? Doubt your doubts. Or yes. Yeah. Yeah. Put it on the shelf. You put it on the shelf. This is something I don't quite understand. So I, I'm not going to understand it in this mortality. And so let's just put it on the shelf and... Think about that uh, later. So that was one of those issues. Okay. So still not a breaking moment, just a shelf moment. It was a it was an on the shelf moment, but it was yeah. a big. It was like a heavy vase on the shelf. Well, for you that's your third, mm-hmm. Darby. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, Brandy. Brandy. Yeah. For you that's your third. Yeah. And for you, Lance, that's your second. Yeah. Big shelf. So mine was yeah. getting way close. So when you were talking about kind of that shift away from. Um, your parenting being more ego centered and more like mm-hmm. fused your sense of self being fused with your children's decisions. Was that in this timeline? Was that in this moment of finding out, um, having Darby kind of come out to you and your response, was that in real time or yes. did that come later? So you had then that experience of, um, you know, 
shifting away from judging to loving. And I would imagine that would also be interesting for you. Did that cause a crack at all? The yes. fact that something so beautiful came from that, that is quite opposite from the parenting that we're kind of shown within the church or prescribed or conditioned to do. Yeah. It, uh, my, my relationship with my daughter just blossomed after that because all of a sudden she's not hiding something from me, which she'd, she'd been hiding it for years from us. And now she's not hiding it from us and she can be really who she is and she can share with us her you know, her victories and her defeats and, and how it, it all works. And so it just, it really opened me up to be able to connect with her even more. And that was in direct contrast to what the church taught me was right and, and where, where I should be able to find that connection and joy with my yes. family. It was opposite of that. Yes. Yeah. That's so big. Yeah. So it was like a whole nother crack. Like, okay, wait a second. How do I how do I come to terms with this? How does this fit? Because now all of a sudden my relationship is even better with my daughter, and I seem to like love her even more, and I'm happy for her that she's happy, but it doesn't fit in with the gospel plan. Okay, wait a minute. How how do I make that work? Yeah. So yeah, another big I can item yep. on the shelf. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and Darby had been, had been, I think that's the other thing is the year before she came out, that's her senior year, we had a lot of conflicts at home. Mm -hmm. uh, it was odd and it wasn't her style. Like I, I just, I didn't understand why she would get, she would, we would be angry at us for stuff. And we, and I think when she did came out, I was like, oh, that, you know, that's, it's a huge, that, and so I was disappointed. And I told her, I said, I'm just disappointed in the year that we didn't have. The year of the relationship that could have been so much better. I could have been better and and I didn't get the chance and she <laughs> apologized and she said yeah but you know we're encouraging lying and mm -hmm. and and it and that affects your relationship so all yes. of a sudden we took that out and like for both of us it was like wow this is a fantastic relation even better than before because there's not the you know the lying the shame all of that 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 goes with that hiding that aspect of your any aspect of your life so it all of a sudden can bloom and yeah that's great joy she kept that all from us because she didn't know how we were going to react. You Which know, is also sad. what what happens? But would, she'd would, heard would a lot of get, lessons, right? Would she get kicked out oh, of the house? Sure. Would she have to find her own place to live? And she's still in high school. Would she? Also, the would, church. You know, the lessons she said. I had a lot of young women's lessons, and I mean, it was all about yeah. I'm going to get married in the temple, and I, you know, and all that. And she would even tell you there was you know, there was a lot of times coming up for that. And I mean, and she and her sister are very close, um, her older sister, Kelty. And Kelty knew, and and she obviously had to keep that on wraps too. And so their relationship was close, but it wasn't, but they all, they all she, she and Kelty had to sort of keep this from us. And I think that was hard on Kelty too. You know, they, they both were lying, so that can't help but hurt a relationship. And, you know, it's going to affect the, all of our relationships. So that really, you know, is something, too, that you don't want to encourage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing to think about, too, is also just how much falls to the child who's holding the secret. This idea that I am the one that's responsible on some level for. Um, so it's like a private grief. They have a private grief that they because of the way that they feel or who they love can't have this ideal, can't have this eternal family for themselves, but okay. it's also asking them to now on some level break their parents' dream too yeah. by coming yes. out. And that is just so, It's a lot so of pressure. It's yeah. a lot of pressure for, yeah, I mean, and I know she, I, I'm sure she felt that. I'm sure she felt that, that, you know, what does that make our family look like down now? down the road. And same reason, maybe I didn't want to, you know, share it with Lance. It's, you know, I, I don't want to be the one that's going to break it up. And I know Darby did feel that. Darby's very sensitive. So I'm sure mm -hmm. she felt that. Yeah. It, that's probably another reason why she didn't. And probably 
guilty too that, you know, we don't want to be the ones that are going to, you know, throw this, this thing sideways. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes in modern times, Mormon apologists are trying to deny that there's a suicidality problem. Oh. Yes. An LGBT youth suicidality problem within Mormonism. We know from the gazillions of interviews on Mormon stories alone, let alone all the other stories out there, that yeah. there is a suicidality problem with LGBTQ Mormon youth. And this makes all the sense in the world. What youth, once they realize they're gay, and they almost always realize between ages 13 and 15, what Mormon youth wants to go to their parents and say, I'm blowing up your Mormon dream today. Yes. Right? Exactly. Yes. And especially, I mean, you know, I just know our family, we had a really close family. It was very, I do think that we, we tried to cultivate a very open dialogue about lots of things, most things. And so I am sure that is why she felt so weighted down. That breaks my heart. And, and why right. she waited till there was going to be a split mm -hmm. amongst us for like four months right. so that we, she could like soften the blow and her own struggle with it as well. So, I mean, it's hard enough to be a teen. Yes. Dar exactly. Darby should not have, have, mm -mm. have to, have, should not have had to have had to carry all of this. Agreed. A privately, secretly, because for of the shame. entire family. Yeah, because, because of the shame and blowing it up, and and you're right, and I, and I do think if Darby wasn't the person she was, because Darby's a very strong person, I think <sighs> yeah, I see how suicide is absolutely unfortunately, a real option for so many kids. And I think to deny it is really, is, is super destructive. Yeah. I gotta be honest. I, I didn't even know that was an issue in, in the Mormon church. I didn't even know that really existed this suicidality, you know, amongst, you know, gay youth in the church because we, it just wasn't on our radar at all. And then when I start looking into things to and try this is by what year, by what year, last year, 2018. <laughs> okay. okay. That's a and, and just for those who don't know, like they don't, it was 2000 and you know, the, I, and not to make it a, but like my Ted talk was 2013. Yeah. Yeah. You know, our LGBT research starts coming out in 14 and 15 by 2017. Tyler Glenn's coming out as gay. Yeah. There's the HBO believer documentary. So that, I saw yeah. that, and yeah. that changed me too. I didn't know a lot of this until I saw that documentary. But, but the point I think for me, the point is the church on some level years before was put on notice that there was this problem and that makes it so unacceptable that you could get all the way into 2020, 2021, and even 2022, and even modern times, where there are Mormons who don't know about this risk yes. of if their LGBT Mormon youth is, you know, uh, if they have an LGBT Mormon child, that there's a severe risk for depression, anxiety, and suicide. Yes. It's, it's like not putting the warning label on the cigarettes. Exactly. Like the, the Mormon church has a responsibility to warn all parents that their children, if they turn out to be gay, have a, have a, a significantly increased suicide risk. And church leaders and those ones that are teaching youth, I think that they, what about, I was a, you know, I was a leader. I think that I needed to, I loved these young women like my own. You need to know that that's a risk. Anything you could be teaching them could mm -hmm. be devastating. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we didn't know. And I was, yeah. I was in the stake presidency for mm -hmm. a couple of years. So I'm certainly most of the church leaders don't, didn't know that this was an epidemic or was an issue. My, our, did, the yeah. bishops certainly didn't know. So, I mean, it just hadn't made it through or it hasn't yet. It still, it still st hasn't. Yeah. It still hasn't yeah. yet. I think people Utah, don't know about this. I think Utah people know a lot more about a lot of things than we do. I, oh yeah, I, the mission field, as they call it. Yes, that's yeah. right. Which I and, just heard that too. I hadn't heard that before. That we're called the mission field. Yeah. yeah. Anything outside of Utah yeah. is, is referred right. to. Yeah, as the mission there's field. a there's a lot that that does not translate outside of of Salt Lake. A lot of church news that does not get outside of Salt. Lake. And I was not the type that you know 
had the church news on my phone. Or the Salt Lake Tribune. Yeah, no, no, right, exactly. Being delivered to your doorstep. Right, and there's a lot that, outside of the Salt Lake, uh, yeah, and this area, that a lot of Mormons do not know. We don't know. Yeah. It, doesn't, it does not translate through, and that's, and where, you know, lives are at stake. It's, that's yeah. really just dis, just disturbing. But also, I mean, maybe how, we, we, how great was Darby <laughs> that she bottled that in for her whole high school I don't know if career? I'd say great, disappointing, but but, yeah. but that she didn't crack. That she didn't crack, or she didn't she she didn't have that ideation that formed in her. That she just felt like, okay, I'm going to be able to live my life, but I just can't tell my parents yet. And she felt like she told us at a safe time and yeah. in a safe place yeah. where she had this out where I'm suddenly, we're not together every day, you know, yeah. and that she was able to get through that without, I, I don't know. It just, it, I, it just makes me appreciate even more the struggle and the turmoil that mm-hmm. she went through personally before finally coming to us. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I also think how lucky and fortunate she was and probably privileged in a way also to have resources in the meantime and enough support and people Absolutely. to talk to like your older daughter yeah and oh and her theater teacher and Absolutely. her and, she, and you are right i feel ter- i mean there i know there's a lot of kids that have no one yeah and they and there is no safe landing and that is heartbreaking and that's why they feel like yeah, they have no option. That's it's not just heartbreaking; it's often deadly. Yeah, yes. it, it, that part is yeah, and and that's what I mean. That's like I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I would have been as strong. In all honesty, I mean, we're just dealing with something kind of, you know, somewhat minor with support around us. I don't know how even grown people, you know, they there's a lot of deep struggles. I'm not strong enough to do it, and yeah. And uh, yeah, I've, kudos to them who live another day too. Yeah. That's that's a big deal. Yeah. So, kudos to Darby. <laughs> right, Thank you, Darby. Um. So, and after all this, isn't it amazing that that maybe wasn't <laughs> enough yet? To I mean, we're hard headed yes. people. Apparently, you're like three or four major issues into finding deep problems with Mormonism. And those weren't the final blows. It's, Even that last one with Darby within a Mormon context isn't necessarily a final blow to your faith and or commitment to the church. Not to shame anyone. No. Just to show how just to show how two more years yeah, just after to that. show how powerful yeah. the hooks are. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. The and the sacrifices. Or, yeah. Because I think the more you sacrifice Absolutely. and the more you the more you're really tied to having it work. Yeah. You You just found the whole formula that Joseph Smith learned a long time ago, right? (laughs) The greater the sacrifice, the greater the commitment. Yeah. It's the sunk cost fallacy. Yeah. The more, the more you've put into something, the less likely you are to want to walk away. from Right. Right. And I think like many of us, we're all in, we we shoved all the chips in. And so it's hard to, to bail. So what was next? In your uh, okay, so are we going back to Le- Lakes Bishop? Is that after Lakes oh. Home? Is that next? Well, that was an issue. Yeah, you could. Is that the next big one? That's what I have on my uh, list. That was more. That was more of a lake issue. But yeah. that well, that affected us. I think. I think. I feel like that was kind of a. We better talk about it now. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we just got. We decided beforehand. We. Yes. Really talk about yeah. it. Lake said, make sure to talk about this. He, did, he, he, he was really about excited it. about talking about it. So we no. have his consent. <laughs> I think that that was a point where maybe I thought, honestly, I think I learned that Lance was more on the same page a little bit that I was. In Lake story. In so Lake we'll story. Tell, we'll tell so, story. So, okay. So Lake called, I think he called. He's home first. from his mission, right? He's yep. home from his missions. He's at, he's at school. He's at UVU. And, and, and Darby's already come out. Yeah. Darby's Darby's already come, come out, out. Yep. And we're, and we're navigating that. And, um, so Kelty and Lake are both at school in, in Utah. At Utah Valley University. Utah University. And, and Kelty's at school at WSU. Darby's at. I mean, Darby's at school at WSU. And were we around Lake? No, I, I don't know. He was no, he called and he was really disturbed. And he said, yeah, he was, you know, he liked going to the temple. He really got a lot of strength from it. 
um, he was definitely still all in. I think he was our last one to sort of not be in. He was yeah. all in. And, um, you know, trying to be a, you know, good return <sighs> missionary and he was dating and he was going to the temple and the temple really served as a spot to, um, for him that was, gave him a good balance, a good checking in point. So he didn't wear a tie one time to church, to his, his ward, his, his college ward. And his bishop called him in and said, why aren't you wearing a tie? And, and started talking to him and somehow it came out. I like, mean, in all fairness, in Mormonism, that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, geez. He's Especially a return missionary. Yeah. Right. And kind of was half and he's, he started, and he in was a, a student new, ward in yes. Provo, Utah. And he was a yeah. new bishop to pretty, pretty new. And like started talking to him and he said, you know, do you have any issues? You know, are you watching porn? Are you, are you masturbating? And like, was like, okay, well, yeah, not the porn thing, but the master and whatever. And the bishop, uh, you can go from here. What did the bishop say to him? He, he, he basically, basically told him that, yeah. uh, that he, he was a sex addict because he looked at porn mm -hmm. and that he, uh, masturbated occasionally and that, uh, he, shouldn't date anymore until he got this under control. And he didn't want him to date any of the girls in his ward. Not to date any of the people predatory. in the ward. Yep. Because he could be predatory because uh -huh. he was a sex addict. Yeah. And, and he took his temple recommend. And he took his temple recommend. And, um, and shamed him pretty, pretty Yeah. There was bad. a lot. And wanted him to come in every week, I believe. Wanted to come to in report on yeah, his status. Yeah, to report Correct. on his status. How was he doing with his Every week. addiction? Yeah. And that was kind of devastating to Lake. Because he gained Shameful. a lot of strength from the temple too. So yeah. to give up his temple recommend when that was kind of the one thing at the time that was helping him to feel, you know, grounded. I remember him calling me and telling me the story. And I'm like, what? Yeah. No, the bishop did not say that to you. You heard it wrong. It, tell me your bishop didn't. He's like, dad, no, this is what he said. He said I was a sex addict. I mean, you are not a sex addict. I mean, Lake was very concerned <clears throat> that he was legitimately a sex addict. Yeah. That he'd been labeled as that. Yeah. And so it was very difficult for him. He knew he wasn't, but being labeled that was... Mm -hmm. And and wanting to and wanting to him to not date any of the girls in the yeah. yeah. So I mean, basically, he ended up. I mean, he did what the bishop wanted him to yeah. do so that he could get his temple recommend back, and yeah. he jumped through the hoops he could until like, he could move to a different ward. <laughs> but I mean, it, honestly, that became a situation where he, you know, we kind of explained it. We said, Lake, you know. I'm sorry. I, you know, I don't want to be graphic, but masturbation, for, you know, for boys, I mean, that's pretty natural. That's not, does not make you a set, a sex addict. It's, it's really not. And, and I, you know, I don't, I mean, but to be labeled those things and to have to check in with a bishop, I mean, he's a 20 year old man. Oh, he's like 25 I mean, at this I mean, point. But, but I mean, the sex drive has to be there or else you wouldn't want to get married. Okay, I hate to break it to you, but that is that is something that is part of our nature. So, yeah. Um, yeah, again, shaming the thing that is actually so there's it's good, and then no, it's bad. And so that was yeah, that was sort of that really made me mad um, and affected me, and and so yeah, that was the next step. And as a as you know, when I was getting my PhD in psychology. I would see students at Utah State University between 2009 and 2015, 16. And, um, you know, I would meet these kids who came to the, to the crisis center, to the counseling center, and they would say to me, I'm an addict. And I'm like, whoa, oh man. And you're a return missionary? What happened? Are you on heroin? Are you on meth? <laughs> and they're like, oh, no, no, no. I, I masturbate once every three weeks. And I'm like, right. what? And they're like, yeah, And but my bishop knows. You know, I even had one kid tell me that his bishop wanted him to text him every night before he went to bed oh my God. To, to report on whether he had been successful at not masturbating that day. Wow. Well, then you're focusing and, on it, and then it happens yeah. even oh, more. Yeah. No, he got to the point where he had injured his 
I'll yeah. be graphic. He had injured his penis masturbating so much because yeah. the bishop's obsession with monitoring his masturbation had yeah. made it, it was so creating he, an obsession. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I mean, this kid lost temper recommend, couldn't take the sacrament in front of the yeah. student ward. Yes. Yes. And it's just this horrible, and it, but it's off, often what makes it even worse is that there's this bishop roulette. Because there's going to be some bishops that are like, right. oh, everybody's doing it. Don't worry about it. Keep your temple recommend. You need the temple exactly. because it's going to help you. And then you'll have these other bishops that are like, text me every night and you're completely on probation until you get this yeah. under control. And yeah. that's what we discussed with them. We said, no, this bishop, it's it's yeah. kind of his thing. And that's right. He couldn't take the sacrament, I believe was the other of thing. Course. And yeah. I thought, wow. And you're right. It is. I mean, we both lived in you know, student wards and you're right. I mean, it's a, Everybody it's a sees real that. gray it's public area, shaming. Yeah. but it's, but if you get a good Bishop or your Bishop who's normal, that they're going to be like, okay, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And we, and that's why we, we actually said that to him. We said, move, change wards. <laughs> yeah, don't go to that ward anymore. Cause it's the Bishop. And, but, but there's some, again, there's some, you know, he's young in his, in his journey in the church even, and they don't know that, and they cannot decipher that. Lance and I have had experiences where we now realize that that's the case, and you can, um, you know, but when our kids are involved, yeah, you try to help them, but um, we don't know what these leaders are saying to them, and that can really affect them. Yeah. 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 So that was... Another... Another crack. It was another crack where... An inspired um, church leader seemed to do something so destructive. And not inspired, speaking yeah. really. It, and, yeah, and we talked about suicidality with LGBTQ youth. This porn masturbation thing can cause yes. not only teens and young adults, e even full-grown men and women. In marriages and everything. It, it can cause suicidality yeah. as well. It's a serious deal. Yeah, it breaks up marriages. Yeah. It it's mm, it really we does. yeah we know people that it's become an issue where it can change the way that spouses see each other it can change the way they see their marriage mm -hmm. it's um it's more destructive than again than the church wants to let people know and yeah. and it's it's disturbing yeah all right so it sounds like your shelves about to break <laughs> there's more there's more items on the shelf for sure yeah. So really, um, yeah, I think the final one was, um, so I was, um, the final one was, I think for me, um, was I was in the state primary presidency and this was right before COVID hit. Um, so it was starting, but we weren't really out yet. And, um, I was the state primary president and, um, I'll be honest with you. I'd never even served in primary before. So uh, I, I w had been in the, I was called to the state primary presidency. And I, so I was a counselor for a long time and kind of knew how things worked. And then, but it's different being a president. And so, so I was then called to the state primary presidency uh, to the, as a president. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I've watched, you know, the other president, I can do this. And, um, and the only reason I say that is because something happened and I didn't know what the protocol was. Um, so we were supposed to have a award conference. Um, and in our award conferences, when we go around to our award conferences, we would go around and we would basically take over the primary for that day. So I called one of the primary presidents who I actually knew pretty well, um, and said, Hey, we're going to be coming to your ward. Um, a lot of times we would have the high, the high councilman kind of, we would do singing time and they would watch the classes and, she said, but she didn't know that's why I was calling. She called me. She said, okay. She said, are you calling about what happened? And I said, what happened? What are you talking about? And she said, well, I just assumed that you were calling to check in about, about the situation. And I didn't know what the situation was. I said, what situation are you talking about? And she said, well, there was a little boy that went to the bathroom with his mom. His mom took he and his brother to the bathroom at our stake center, which is where I went to church too, at our stake center. And he was approached by somebody. I don't know what happened. She didn't know what happened. It was some kind of a, an approach, a, either a touching situation, a, a, 
something and something inappropriate happened. Something inappropriate, and he came out. The brother and the and the little brother came out and told their mother, and their mother immediately went to the bishop. And I said, "What?" And this happened in our stake center. And sh she said, "Yeah." And then that state pres and then the the bishop, I guess, knew who it was and approached. But they went to the state presidency, and I said, "When did this happen?" And she said, two weeks ago. And I said, are you kidding? So this happened in your ward where a, a, a primary child was um, somehow sexually abused in our stake center, and I was not told about it. No other primary was told about it. I'm like, I was really concerned. I thought, what if there, if, because we're, you know, on a kind of a busy street. And I thought, did somebody come into our church building? from the outside? Was it what? And she said, yeah, I, I don't know that much about it. And she said, I told our bishop and our bishop said that they took care of it. So I immediately called my, uh, the counselor who was over state president and I had to be kind of careful, but I was like, did this happen? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, why didn't you guys tell me? Why haven't we been able to tell at least the other primary presidents so that they can, you know, notify their, their parents to at least be careful, watch your child when you, you know, maybe whatever. And he said, well, you know, I, and he was, um, he said, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't, this is what we wanted to avoid. We didn't want to, you know, cause some alarmism. And I was like, oh, really? That right. was your concern? <laughs> well, I'm the wrong person for that. No, I just said, no, I, I just thought I, I was really taken aback. And I said, well, now wait a second. Do you know who the person was? Was, were they, was this person um, apprehended? Uh, do our, ch our charges being filed? Were the police called? And he said, we've talked, to, we've been talking to the police. And, and I said, and he said, it, was, it, it wasn't somebody from the outside. It was a, a, somebody from uh, another ward. We're on it. We're taking care of it. And I said, okay, well, I'm still you know, confused as to why you're not giving me information basically. But he basically was like, listen, it, it has nothing to do with you. It, this is not. And I said, well, we have to go and, and talk to this ward and we're going to have a training and things. And I, and I could tell even that this primary president was not, was unsettled. And I said, you were talking to the police and I, you know, come a little bit from the background. I said, hey, do you mean, have you pressed charges? And they're like, well, we're talking to the police and they're not really sure what they're going to do yet. I said, well, could you follow up with me and let me know? And he's like, well, you know, really it, it, everything it's taken care of. And I said, well, no, really it's not. And I said, could you just let me know? And he said, well, you know, if something comes of it and that, and that, that was it. And that's all I've ever heard. But I remember I, I actually followed up with him later and I, and I think I remember saying, so whatever happened with that and do we know who it is and shouldn't we warn other the teachers, the other primaries. And, and he said, well, and I talked to her and she said, well, they had done, um, she said, we have a new policy that, you know, parents have to take the children to the bathroom. And I was like, well, I believe the child was taken to the bathroom. And I, I found out other information from somebody that I was talking to that I think that this was something that happened from, I think it was a, a youth of somebody's family, but I think there was an incident prior to that. And parents were supposed to be keeping an eye on this person and, and weren't. And so then I kind of talked to my state president and I said, you know, and I just remember thinking, I'm not going to be a party to a cover up. I'm not going to do this. And I think that was my final, that was my final straw where I watched how that was handled. And I thought if I had a, if I had a child in primary at this stage and I'd found out this happened and I others, because they didn't want us to tell other primaries or anything, any other primary leaders, and it was all very, and I thought I would be infuriatingly mad because it's about protecting my child and about protecting these children. And it just clearly was not, the, that was not the point. And so I remember that was my final where I thought, oh, okay, I know, I now know how this goes. Yeah. And I, I do know that yeah. I don't think that they actually contacted the police. We have several policemen that are members you and I, and I honestly them. believe that they spoke to them rather than that, that is my conjecture, but I'm pretty sure because yeah, I'm sure there was other things involved, but I just, all I know is that I was not, I wasn't happy with it. Um, we did a training after that specifically with them about, um, 
the sex abuse training and the bishop was there and the whole and the whole ward and all the teachers were there but you could tell they were all really bothered by it and i and i think that they wanted answers afterwards and really didn't get them either and really quickly like it, some a mormon brain is going to be like well they were just trying to protect the confidentiality of the people involved and by the way you're not a priesthood leader why are you even asking questions well you don't want to start this big panic Right. You don't want this to, you also don't want people to start pointing fingers as to who it might be and, and start to, you know, cause that would be terrible mm -hmm. too, to stigmatize somebody for maybe something that wasn't, I don't know. But on the other side of it, your job as stake, stake primary president yeah. is to protect and look after the children. So, I mean, I you, you had so. every right and responsibility and yeah. obligation to be asking about, I need more information so I can help keep these kids safe. And I thought so. But then I also, I also thought the Mormon brandy in me was like, okay, well also I don't have a right to know everything because, because I, you know, my priesthood holders are, my priesthood told me they took care of it. Yeah. And so the, yeah, the Mormon side of you is like, okay, well I, you know, I don't have that mantle to handle this yeah. or to, you know, is it my curiosity or is it just my, you know, and I, and yeah, I think I've definitely was made to feel, you know, pat you on the head and move you along. Yeah. And so I want to, we'll have Maven include in the show notes, our episode with Colby and Cami Reddish, a couple from Idaho yeah. that, that found out about a cover up of a, of a Bishop who was a sexual yes, abuser yeah. Yeah. and how the state president just, all they cared about was keeping it quiet to protect the reputation of the church to protect the priesthood leadership at the expense of the safety of the ward members. And then also when the AP story came out recently about, you know, the Arizona story yeah. and the sexual abuse cover-ups, we did several episodes on that, that, you know, without going into that in detail, viewers and listeners, if you want to understand, we know about spotlight in the Catholic church. We've covered the boy scout sexual abuse scandal yeah. This, this is a big deal, and we've co covered it on several Mormon Stories episodes, and we'll refer you to those in the show notes. But and I think I was had been I had listened to those, and I just felt like, wow, I, I could see this is a minuscule of that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, I it was the first time that personally I'd seen it. And I think I was like, oh, wow, yeah, no. And I and the, the pushback, the minor pushback that I got, um, I thought, wow, that's, you know, uh, over an incident. And I don't, again, I don't even know, I don't even know. And and I think that was what disturbed this speaking for, but I think even this primary president and some of the teachers were like, you know, and, and even then, even in the training that we were giving, the training that we were giving were, was really, and I'm sure you know this, if you are in the church, that the main training for even um, if teachers in primary see that there's potential abuse even at home with these children is the, the thing you do is you tell your primary president, your primary president drops it at the bishop's door. That's it. That's, there's no knowing how it's followed up. There's no, there's no calling CPS. There is no, um, you know, you're not a mandated reporter and that's too bad. And that's, and, and really there is no, because it's all about keeping it in house. And that's, yeah, for somebody like me, that's, I don't, I'm not okay with that, but. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, I mean. That's it. That broke. <laughs> then. And that's what broke your shelf? Yeah, that's definitely, I think that was my very, that was, but <laughs> that was what broke my shelf. I still didn't tell Lance. <laughs> and how long ago was that? Uh, two years ago, nineteen at the pandemic. Twenty pandemic started, and yeah. But you, so your shelf broke at that point. So my shelf broke, but what? I, but I still you was the. Concluded what? Well, so I was still the stake primary president, <laughs> and I knew that I knew that my faith was waning, so yeah. it was hard. Um, but I did not want to go and talk to the leaders, and I also didn't really want to talk to him. So I kind of just, I really just swallowed it and said, "I'm just gonna, I can go along." I'm just going to go along. And I didn't want to call and ask to be released because I knew it would be a conversation about me not having faith and not believing this anymore for, you know, the start of not, and I just wasn't sure. And it, that was a lot of turmoil. I will say that was hard for me. I had a lot of hard and I prayed and I had some issues and I, but, um, 
eventually they called me in um, and said, hey, you know, we're going to release you. I said, super awesome. Thank you. I used to tease with them many times. Are you releasing me? No. Okay. Well, it's going to be soon, right? And so and so I wasn't sad. And he's like, oh, yeah, your bishop will call you to something. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't think so. Um, and so then it was the pandemic. So it was right before the pandemic was sort of starting back. It was, was we could we're start going back to church. Mm-hmm. So I was primary president through the pandemic. And in, in Washington state, we did not have in-person church for a year. For a year. For a, so. Yeah, for a full year. There was no, it was Because our state president was in the health field. So yeah. it was nice that he was overly, we didn't have to go to church for a long time. So it was really nice. Um, but yeah, so it was right as we started to come back, it was time to start going back to church. The what? That Lance and I had a conversation. That's when you go ahead. Uh, so Lance, Lance, uh, we were, we were supposed to be starting to go back to church and, um, and Lance, it was Sunday and Lance got up and he's like, so do you want to go to church? And I'm like, do you want to go to church? And he said, um, not really. And I said, okay, why? And he, and he said, um, I, I really don't think I want to go back to church. I've liked having my Sundays off. I've liked, I just don't. And I said, is that the only reason? And he said, honestly, no. He said, I don't, I don't think I believe it anymore. And, and I knew that I would never tell him that I didn't believe anymore until he did first, because I didn't want to have, I didn't want to be that person. And I didn't want to have that relationship. And so I took a deep breath and I was like, and he goes, well, what about you? And I said, I don't believe it anymore. And, and I said, and I don't want to return to church. And he said, okay. And so that started our sort of listening to Mormon stories together. And actually I didn't, I had never even heard of Mormon stories. Uh, we were here with Kelty and her roommate, Jill. Hey, Jill. Uh, Jill said, Hey, cause we listen to a lot of podcasts when we travel around. And she said, oh, you guys should listen to Mormon stories. And I said, well, I would never listen to something that said Mormon stories on it. <laughs> Not John DeLynn. He's a jerk. No, no we, we, and I said, oh, what is, what is that? And she said, yeah, now nah. he's, she said, it's just podcasts. He gets different guests on that just talk about different topics and, and talk about t- truth claims and different things. And I just think you'd find it interesting. And I was like, okay. And so, yeah, I started listening to that and wow, it's, it opened up a lot of, truth claim things that we didn't even know and, and open the door for us to just go a little, at least for me, a little further. How about you? So it didn't cause your no. loss of faith. Oh, absolutely not. No, no, no. But no. once you had lost your faith, it became a resource to help you process. Your yes. Loss yes. Of faith. A great, re- I think. Yeah. Because we, I had never been exposed to a lot of the truth claims. It's other than the things that I would find by myself. And so I, and honestly, I think that even the guests, even like the tanners and things like that, that it just opened up things that I didn't know. And then I would further on and go and research. So no, absolutely not. Um, I don't think that that's this kind of podcast. I really don't. And I think like most, like a lot of people, they're like, well, if that's what you lose your faith over. And it's like, well, that's not, you're right. If that's what I lost my faith over, my testimony wasn't very strong. The fact is, is that, I was already having issues and then it just gave me a resource to start the ball rolling of really looking into what the church should have been telling me from the start so that I could have really known what I was agreeing to. Right. Informed consent. It's, um, and having language. I mean, I feel like I'd never heard of progressive Mormons. I think Lance and I were already progressive Mormons. And then I think, um, but I never had a term like that. I just figured, and I thought we were very rare alone. Yeah. And so, Lance, do you want to do you want to talk about uh, anything? <laughs> your process? Yeah, sure. Because you were the more believing of the I, two. I was the more believing. I I've, I've always had issues okay. with certain things, polygamy and and blacks in the priesthood and LGBTQ issues and and the stone in the hat translation and the Mountain Meadows massacre. I've always had issues with all these topics, but I could always apologize them away because I still felt like it was the right way to raise a family and be a forever family. And then when Darby came out to us, 
that cracked for me. And I realized I need to look into this stuff. So as she was going through her faith issues and crisis, I had started researching things myself and started to look at other sources beyond the church documented, you know, the the resources directly from the church. I started looking elsewhere. I read the CES, CES letter, which had a major impact on me. And the um, it just it was just one more thing that went on the shelf that caused it to just start to buckle under the pressure. Do you want to mention some of the things you learned in the CES letter that that were important? The specific thing, the, the thing that made the biggest difference to me was the fact that there's no DNA evidence of of people in South or Central America that came from Jerusalem Hebrews, or Israel. Yeah. yeah, that there isn't, you know, Hebrew DNA evidence, you know, in the in the populations there, and that the the sites, all the Book of Mormon sites that should be there or there should be some archaeological evidence of, there isn't. So those were those were the biggest issues that came from the CS letter. The other thing is the whole gospel to me hinged on Joseph Smith and the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. And if, if the Book of Mormon is true, then Joseph Smith is a prophet. If, if that was translated, then it was a prophet. And learning that he did a lot of that translation by with his face in a hat that came out in the gospel topics essays and that was given to us by the church resources, that, that was like a slap in the face. Like, why have you been hiding this for my entire life? I, that's not what I learned. That's not how I was taught when I, you know, on my mission, it wasn't what I was taught in the MTC. It wasn't what I learned growing up. And then they, they dropped this on us, you know, was it five or six or seven years ago that the gospel topics essays came out? So that, that had a big impact on me about that. Um, but again, I would always take it back to the family. Is this the best thing for my family? But um, what finally cracked for me that made the, the biggest difference after I'd learned all these other things was, was, was actually listening to a Mormon Stories podcast with uh, Evan Smith. Um, Evan Smith was a, uh, he was, a, he was in a state presidency in the Boston area for a number of years. He was a, a lawyer for a huge firm in Boston. Um, very smart, well-researched, brilliant man. And how he, in, he had a son that came out as gay to their family who, um, there are a couple episodes of more stories about this, um, um, Evan Smith and Weston Smith, his son. And um, listening to Evan explain the issues that he had with the church and the how the Book of Mormon could actually potentially have been written by Joseph Smith and not just translated. And the way he described that just clicked with me. And it made me realize that my whole belief that Mormonism is true was based on the fact that the Book of Mormon is true and that the Book of Mormon was true. I only felt it was true because of the way I felt. It was a feeling, not research or science, or, or it was all just based on a feeling. And that, and that that fact could be that, that I could have been misconstrued all of that just by believing that I felt good when I read it and that the Holy Ghost was telling me that the Book of Mormon is true, it was all based on a feeling, not nothing scientific or fact or fact-based. And then finding all these issues with the, with the fact-based issues of the historicity of the Book of Mormon just doesn't add up. That all came out or came to me kind of quickly, and I realized, <coughs> okay, 
maybe this isn't true. And if this isn't true and Joseph Smith isn't a prophet, then wait a minute. Wait a minute. He made up the word collab? What? I, how do I, you know, what is, how do I, I, I it, it, my whole shelf just crumbled at that. It just, it completely disintegrated. And I realized, okay, I may, I, I don't, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. And I, I don't know. How do I tell my parents that? How do I tell my brothers and sisters that? How do I, you know, how do I reconcile that with my, with my wife, with my family? And little did I, you know, I didn't realize Brandy had been going through those same issues herself, but she's been keeping them to herself. And so when, when we finally had that conversation that we both realized that we didn't want to be a part of it anymore, it was like, it was, it was euphoric. <laughs> it was kind of weight like, lifting, it was probably. very weightlifting, like, okay, okay, wait. Okay, so maybe we aren't going to be a part of this anymore, but we still get to be together. Be together <laughs> and we still get to do this together. It would have been very difficult or much more difficult to do this without Brandy or if we hadn't been able to yeah, I feel kind of do for this those together. Faith people, I think that's, that's a struggle. Yeah. So those were, I guess, some of the biggest issues I came with. And, and, you know, and the more research you do and the more reading you do, it's, it, you just find more and more issues. And it, it would be, for me, I always thought, okay, how can these brilliant, smart people that I know still believe in in the Mormon doctrine and still be a part of it. We've you know, had that conversation a lot. Right. You How, know, you know, it's people that I really respect and, and that, that are... but I realized for myself, it was, I'm not trying to put myself in the brilliant, smart people <laughs> category, but sure. whatever. But I realized that it's because I, I stayed away from that stuff. I just didn't educate myself on anything that didn't come from a church resource because that's not, what I was taught where I would find truth. And I had invested in sunk costs. I had invested so much time and effort and money and personal space and, and commitment to it for so many decades that I didn't want to feel like I had wasted that. And I still don't feel like I wasted that. But, but I realized that it was okay for me to believe differently and that it was going to be okay for us. Mm. Wow, that's powerful. It was hard. <laughs> it was it was really hard. You know, I, I, I certainly I was very worried what would happen with my family, and you know, kudos to Darby for having the courage to finally tell us. And my, my kids have all gone through their own faith journeys. I'm not going to share those with you here. Right. Um, and, and they've all had their own issues and their own experiences. But I certainly, I was petrified that if we didn't have the church in our life, that we would not be happy as a family, that I was always told the gospel is the plan of happiness. If you want to be happy and have a successful and fulfilling life, then you have to have the gospel in it to really accomplish that. And what we have found over the last few years is our family has grown closer and been tighter than ever. And we're not part of the church anymore. That our, our, my love for my, my daughters and my son has just <laughs> grown and gotten better. Um, I, the, the joy and happiness between Brandy and I and our marriage has just improved and gotten better. It's just been, it's been, it's been a wonderful transition for us. So, so far, <laughs> it's been, it's been good. It's, and I think I would just want to, I just want to give people hope that 
that there is joy and happiness and fulfillment outside of the gospel. And it's not, it doesn't, you know, we haven't really, we haven't changed our lifestyle at all. Being, we've been out of the church for several years now, but we haven't changed our lifestyle. I don't, we still don't, we don't drink coffee or drink alcohol. It's just not on our radar. It's just not part of I mean, we didn't want we extra are. expense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but you know. We're... But a 10% raise in Sundays off is pretty nice. Not bad. <laughs> but, of course, I'm kidding, but. But I think we let our, I will say that we, we didn't go to our children and say, we've left the church. We kind of let them do their own thing. So I think that's like, I didn't want to tell Lake because I knew Lake was still, you know, I mean, I, Kelty had, had left the church probably first. Um, she liked coffee and she just, you know, she did, she did not, she was, a, I think right at college, she's like, I do not believe this. She definitely is um, very women empowerment. She's, you know, she did like, she's the one who she did femme, which is the women's in film. She's in film and, and did a women's conference for, um, for women in film in, in Salt Lake. In Salt Lake City. She organ so, I mean, she's just very, and so it did not mesh up with her at all. And so, uh, and she just didn't. So she was the first one to probably leave. And then Darby, coming out and then Lake was probably the last one. And so we really didn't talk to, to didn't say to Lake, but uh, one of the things that where Lake kind of came to us is, you know, after president Holland's um, mm -hmm. talk, uh, musket fire, musket fire, pick up your muskets. It bothered Lake a lot. And it was enough again for him to start thinking, you know, I want to support my, my sister and this sort of, talk of with guns and things and rhetoric and this kind of thing and basically make a choice. He's like, I think I'm going to choose my family. And I, I just can't sort of rectify that. And then he started looking into things. Uh, I read banner of heaven and some other things and realized that it didn't really mesh with his. And I, you know, if you want to talk to him later, you can, you know, they can have, they had their own faith journeys individually. And then we sort of came to them and said, you know, we waited for them to really tell us that they weren't really believing members. And we said, yeah, okay, we're not either. Let's, as a family, decide that this won't break us. And that, you know, I mean, I feel like we had good conversations with them, but I think Lance's and our vision was sort of, you know, we wanted them to come to it by themselves and and always have that conversation that, if you're in or out, we still love you. Yeah. And you're still this, in, we are still the Heplers. Um, and I think, but I think everybody, but knowing that they all were out, what did that look like? And did that still, was that still going to be this looking like eternal family? It was still going to be, are we still going to grow close together? So. Yeah. When you were talking about um, uh, you know, experiencing kind of your, a better marriage now, kind of what, how would you talk about that? What makes it better now? Well, it's not, it's not merit based, <laughs> you know, it's not like, okay, if we are, if we're reading our scriptures and saying our prayers together and going to church, then we are good people and we are doing the right thing so that our marriage is actually going yeah. to be good. Right. And so we're not, we don't do those mm. things, but. Kind of like you're not performing. Right. Yeah. We're just yeah. being true and authentic with each other instead of putting on the show as the, as the, mm. as the good Mormon family, a good Mormon couple. And yes. when you take away those safeguards and you actually still have a great marriage and you're friends and you enjoy each other. Wow. <laughs> that's sort of liberating. Yeah. It's like, oh, wow, okay, we took, you know, the baby bumpers and we still want to be in the crib. Yeah. You know? And so it's kind of like, oh, it, that can be very, um, you realize that, that it was always the relationship. Mm. That it wasn't the, um, yeah, it wasn't the rewards. It wasn't those things that you were promised. It was like, honestly, it's like when kids leave, you know, they, they leave the house um, and they realize that they're great adults and they've made good choices. It's this feeling I didn't need somebody to govern me. 
And so I think that's been very good for us where it's like, yeah, it was always about that we have a great relationship and that we enjoy each other and that we, um, and that we, you know, at the end of the day that, that I want to be with this person, not because I'm afraid that I, if I do the wrong thing, they're not going to want to be with me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. I just want to check. <laughs> Just double checking. <laughs> I know that you do a lot together. Was that always true or is that something that you've had to cultivate? Well, I mean, when I, when I was working, um, it, no, I, I mean, I was working 60 hours a week, so we didn't have as much time to do things together. Mm -hmm. But, uh, since we, since I've retired, I retired about five years ago. Um, you know, we, we travel around the country in a sprinter van and I, I, go to different bike races or bike camps. Um, we're into rocks and rock hounding. Big <laughs> and so we travel together way more than we did before. So we spend a lot of time together now. And part of that's because I'm retired and part of that's because there's like no pretense in our marriage anymore. It's, I know who she is. She knows who I am. We love each other. And luckily we, our kids have all grown right in there with us and it's, it's become this wonderful thing. It's been just wonderful. But you know? I do think we've always sort of like, we've, we've, I think that we like, I think we've always liked each other's independence too. Um, I don't need, like he lets me do soccer and other things and doesn't, you know, like we can be our individuals and he does the cycling, whatever. So I think that that's probably always been, that's been something that's always been good about our relationship is that we like our independence, but then we really have always had fun with each other. Mm -hmm. I still think he's pretty funny and that's kind of a big deal. Um, but he, I mean, who doesn't like Lance? I mean, come on. I'm married really well. Lots of people. So I don't know them, but I mean, I will say in all honesty, I'm married really well. I've always felt that no, way. No, I married really well. Okay, whatever. But I, but I do think that... As far as a good marriage, I, I think that in or out of the church, that probably would have been the case. But the fact that we did leave the church together and had a family that, that we maintain, um, it's made him more attractive to me. Um, it's, and also the fact that his watching his philosophy and our philosophy together, seeing how centered he is on, on wanting to continue to make our family there's nothing, I just, like I said, there's nothing more attractive. So doing things together and we've had to make an effort to make sure that we do constant, you know, that we're going to focus on the same principles for that we're in the church as far as family building, that, that we found that those principles are good. There are principles we really liked from the church. There's stuff that we didn't like from the church. So we're going to leave those behind yeah. and sort of focus on the things that we did like. Yeah. And, um, and build from there. And I think that's, you know, as parents, you, you try and model for your kids too, like, like just healthy relationships. And, um, and I feel like we've seen our kids now move on to that and really proud of them and then all include it, you know? And, um, yeah, that's, I think that's been something that's, again, they're, they're just all these little things that strengthen you outside of the church that you realize it wasn't the church necessarily. It's the thing that you focus on is the joy that you found in your family and that you continue to grow in your family and open dialogue and, and, you know, um, yeah. And, and those, and also like, you know, like we said, building your community, <laughs> you may not have a community anymore within church, but I mean, Lance is, you know, we do a lot you know, with cycling community, whatever his community is that we, f we find building those relationships up. And I realize we're lucky, but, um, sometimes pushing yourself out a little bit and church is an easy way to sort of build a community. But, but I mean, I found, you know, new friends in pickleball. We were talking about that and, um, and through my children and things. Well, if you want, if you want to serve other people and the joy that comes from serving other people, you can always find places to do that. It, the church doesn't have a monopoly on serving other people or on happiness. And no. I guess we weren't, we were afraid that wasn't going to be the case, but yeah, it didn't end up being, but I think too, but yeah, I mean, yeah. 
Uh, I do. Th uh, we worry about, you know, where, where we go from here as far as, so we do have a lot of family and friends that are, you know, that are in the church and we respect that and things, but, of course. but I don't know how those conversations are going to go, but, um, well, you're, we've had you're mentioning at lunch that there are people who don't know. Yeah. I have, I have sisters that don't know at this point. They probably do now. Um, maybe parents talk about your conversation with, uh, yeah. yeah, I, Steve. we just have, I mean, I have good, my good close college buddies. Um, they, they both knew that I wasn't, uh, really attending church anymore, but didn't know to what level, but I did have that conversation with him this week because I didn't want them to find out. How'd that go? If you want to share. <laughs> um, I think that's a good thing to share. Hey, no, it is, is a good thing. Um, uh, <laughs> One was a hard conversation and one wasn't. Which I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. I actually thought it would have been different. I, would, I thought it would have been different. But um, he he was just, one of my good friends was just worried that, you know, why why can't you just quietly go away? Why do you have to go on a national broadcast and and tell everybody what, you know, you've been through? I. I, I have I've carefully cultivated my online you know persona that is not controversial at all, and this is not one of those. <laughs> and he's like, "Why are you doing this now? You haven't been you, you don't you've avoided controversial subjects for twenty years. Why are you doing this now? Well, you're you're rowing your boat out to the island, and then you're setting the boat on fire when you get there. And so why why are you doing that? And, and my response to him was, "Well, because I feel like." I could give hope to other families that were in our situation that have a an LGBTQ child and they don't know how they're going to navigate it or they think it might be the end of their happiness with that. And if if us sharing our story can can show that that doesn't have to end the happiness, then it can be good for other people. So I guess I'm going to take the risk of being controversial to be able to give other people hope, which potentially could save lives. Which is like the, the people that have shared their story before us mm -hmm. gave to us. Yeah. If those people weren't willing to come on here and, and same thing with you, if, if, they, if people aren't willing to share the stories and sort of share the journeys they've navigated it would have been more difficult for us to do it. And you just live in that space of conflict without resolution. Mm -hmm. And feeling alone. Yeah. Feeling absolutely alone, like you're the only one that, and you don't know what it looks like. And um, yeah. So that was the biggest thing that came from those conversations. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, you know, um, you've touched a lot about the joy and the joy and the expansion and the healing I'm curious if anything comes to mind, actually, that's been really hard or challenging in the rebuilding. Uh, that's a good question. I, <coughs> my, my parents are both still alive, and they don't really know. And I don't know how I'm going to have that conversation with them yet. Hopefully, I can just direct them towards this. <laughs> just send them a link. Just send them yeah, exactly. a link. <laughs> Is that that's really avoiding conflict right there? <laughs> just I don't want to have the conversation. Just listen to this <laughs> show. Um, yeah, that's been hard. Um, mm -hmm. Having conversations with people I really respect and love who are still in the church, you know, yeah. um, those conversations have been difficult. So. I don't know. What about you? We still have more conversations. We still have to more have. conversations. There's, yeah, yeah. We have some some close family members that we are good friends with and travel with, and we're having we they don't know it, but we're going to have that because we respect them so much, and they're very in the church, and just sort of want them to know. I think identity has been a little issue with me too. Um, you know, for a long time, I was you know mm -hmm. even my soccer friends. I didn't play tournaments on Sunday. I didn't. You know, I was. Um, yeah, I was, you know, the one that didn't drink. So, and it was just such an easy way to say that. So, but I, and I think that, and also, I think that honestly, I'll be honest with you, 
the, as far as my journey is, I don't know that it's been very difficult. I've gone on to sort of, do I believe in Christ and with the Bible and things like that. And, mm -hmm. and that's been a tough one too, because I, you know, I have always sort of, obviously the Bible's more, you know, stories sort of thing. Um, and just, you know, was there a God? And, and I've had great conversations with my, with my brother. And I just listened to the podcast, uh, the Buddhism con, con, you know, which is funny cause I had just been talking to my brother and he had, had discussed Buddhism with me. And funny enough, I have a really good soccer friend that I would talk to her a little bit when I was in the church. And she said, are you sure you're not a Buddhist? Because I was, you know, I'm really big into like learning, just opening up and just, you know, I don't know everything. So learning. And so it just kind of funny because I, I don't, there's so many gods that people have believed in over centuries. And that also has always interested me, just all different religions. So, but I think at the end of the day, it's been hard because when I pray at night, who do I pray to? Do I need to pray? And um, I'm used to, I have a very, I'm a person who has a very grateful heart, I think, when I'm in nature, I mean, I just, I, I appreciate so much of the world around me. And so where do you put that? And that's been a struggle for me to know where, where do I give that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's where I'm at right now. Just sort of, um, because we're so used into in, being in the church and you have a very specific place where you can put those things and you can throw your questions. And if something's not going right, you can pray and ask to be, for it to be fixed. And there's almost this. And so that's my struggle right now is learning, trying to figure out a, where do I put faith and what do I have faith in? Right. Mm -hmm. So I have faith in my family right now. And I, but you know, that's, and yeah, I don't worry so much about the next life for sure. That doesn't really, you know, that doesn't affect me as much as where do I put all the feelings and things I have right now? Where is a good spot for those? It makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, those are, our, those are our big struggles. Some I guess. of the harder. But, yeah. But having a family and I mean, I, you know, I realize that we're lucky. I'm not going to take that for granted. I, we realize that our, you know, our story is somewhat unique, that, that our kids are cl close with us. And so that, that gives me strength and that, you know, that at least we have a place to put that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some sense you've, what's hard about this is I think it's probably because things have gone so well <laughs> that you're able to come on Mormon stories. Yes. And what's probably underrepresented on Mormon stories are the the instances where one spouse left but the other stays. Yes. And maybe it blows up the marriage. Or both parents lose their faith, but several of their kids are still in, or their kids are married to people who are still in. And so everybody's got to keep it quiet like you were doing yes. for yeah. so many years, Brandy, or in some Great. sense both of you were doing <clears throat> And in some sense have been doing up until today, just because it's so hard in Mormon culture to simply stand up and say, I don't believe anymore. Right. Um, but in some sense, you, your family, you know, the Hepler family was really fortunate because you're all unified and that doesn't always happen. I, I yeah, that, that, agree, yeah. that blessing is not lost on us. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. not. And it's privilege that I think probably motivated you to want to come tell your story. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people who can't tell their story. Yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I, and I think, I know you've talked a lot about changing the culture. I don't know if we ever could, but if we could, I do think that that's the thing that limits you is the, it's that, it's that fear. And, and also that sort of rhetoric that um, if somebody is gone from the church, that you can't still have that, a relationship with them or that, um, that, uh, I forget who's telling us, somebody was telling us that, you know, that they've had friends that, you know, have bragged about not talking to their kids and, um, yeah. and, and yeah, just, I wish there was more stigma to that, you know, and I, and it, <coughs> and I, yeah, but we do recognize that, yeah, telling our telling a story on on Mormon stories is great when we have this great happy ending, so to so to speak, and yeah. that is not the case with, I'd say a lot of most yeah. people. So, I don't know how to navigate that. Um, and honestly, I wasn't brave enough to come out and tell Lance when that was a risk. 
So, you know, I mean, that's true. Uh, and that says something, people that are brave enough to do that, that's, that's pretty bold and I'm good for them, but I wasn't, I'm not that brave. I wish I was, but I'm not. I think this is such an important story and I'm so glad you came on because I do think when you're so immersed in the church, you absorb messages and just all the messages about what happens when you leave and they're never good. It's yeah. always like a catastrophe. Your life's going to fall apart. Your kids are going to hate you. Your marriage is going to fall apart. You're not going to have success in your life. Those are all the things that you're told is going to happen if you leave. Yeah, you're going to be you homeless. You can't be happy. No, you can't be no. happy. It's, yes, it's not there for you. Yeah. You can't and be joyful. You can't even more so by yourself. Yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You'll be a terrible... Yeah, you're not helping your kids. And yeah, that's... Yeah. It definitely is the message. And, you know, I, I mean, I know, I, you know, I pictured, yeah, being homeless, you know, and an addict on the street if you leave the church, right? right? It's pretty, not that there's any shame in that, but I'm just saying that, you know, yeah, it, it, they definitely, it definitely, you feel like everything will be stripped away. Um, I even taught that, you know, I mean, I was involved in teaching that um, as a missionary and as a young women's president. And you believe that. You re I, to the core of me, believe that that was true that there wasn't real happiness. Um, yeah, anything else? No. Okay. Um, really quickly, you had mentioned uh, Donna Showalter's Mormon Stories interview being really important to you. Did you ever explain why? <clears throat> Did I miss that? Or no, uh, no, we, that was a conversation we had on, off the air. Um, yeah, it's Donna Showalter, she is a East Bench Provo Relief Society president who um, also had uh, LGBTQ son and um, it ended up basically leading to her uh, loss of faith. And I, I, I think I list, so her shows were from five or six years ago, I believe with you. And her story was just extremely emotional. What she went through and how she came through on the other side and same thing, was able to find happiness and joy on the other side. But as a, in, she was, she was much more devout and faithful than I ever was. And to see that she could go through this faith journey as well, uh, made it, made a big impact on me. So those shows were impactful to me as well, listening to them. She's the one that's, that worked at Encircle. Yes, that, yeah. yeah, she yeah, worked at Encircle. In, in explain Encircle, it is... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a support. sort of like a safe house, a, a set, a series of safe houses throughout Utah mm -hmm. for, for LGBT, LGBT youth. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. we just found out our nephew helped build one and... Yeah, in Salt Lake, who's involved with that, and we also have a friend who's who's helping get one up and running in Ogden. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, so, it's just, so a shout out to Donna and Stephanie and the good people. Yeah, uh, at in Circle Past yes. and Present. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. All right. Well, what a powerful story, Thank you. and uh, and how does it feel to know? That just like the Smiths or the Show Walters influenced you, your story may influence others. I don't want to think about that. I, <laughs> I, uh, you, you hope that it does good and that this is this is a shining light for other people is what I would hope. That it would it would bring some relief or some joy to somebody else. So yeah. or hope. Or hope. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hope. yeah. If somebody yeah. takes a little thing away, that would be great. Um and if they don't, 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 please don't message me. I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I, I just, yeah, we hope that, uh, yeah, we hope it's, we hope it's something good. Uh, I was telling you earlier, our, our daughter Kelty had said that, I think if, I think that, you know, she said that she was proud of us for, because it is easy for members to leave and not, and not stand up and say that, you know, the things that, that they don't think are okay, that she was really proud of us that we were willing to, to stand up and, and I am sure that there will be a lot of other people. I hope after us that will see that that it's worth it. 
And uh, we appreciate what you guys do because it's not easy. Yes. We're not in the line of fire. You are. And I, yeah, I mean, I know it gave us a lot of hope, these people's different stories. So maybe somebody will hear ours and feel like they can navigate it and it's okay. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being willing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having yeah, us. Thanks for the platform too. Yeah. And I'll just say again, thank you so much, Brandy and Lance uh, Hepler for being willing to share your story to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, this was really powerful. And I just want to echo your gratitude, your expression of gratitude to Lake Kelty and Darby, because as Marky and I know, it's not just our story, it's our kids' story yes. and everybody all, all the family is contributing in one way or another. And so shout out, shout out to you guys as Yay, well. Yes. Thanks for allowing me. And Julie parents. too. Julie is actually my daughter's fiance. Yeah. Our, our daughter Darby is Whoa. engaged. Oh. Yep. Yeah. She gets married in July and she's an amazing person. She, yeah. Oh. It's fantastic. We're super happy to have her I, in our like family, in our even, life. Yeah. They're actually living exciting. with us right now. Oh. And yeah. So if you met her, getting, she's the nicest. Yeah. She was per the minute I met her, I knew that she was the right person for Darby, which also helped me to know that she was, it was all okay. Yeah. yeah that Congrats, it was. Julie and Darby. Yeah. And Margie and I relate because our we have some partners Yay. to our children that we're very uh, That you know are the right ones, yes. right? To just fit yes. in. At least for now. Yes. Right. As far as we know. <laughs> and that's good enough. That's good and enough. And that is good for enough. enough. Yeah. That is good enough. They yeah. they'll add wonderful things. And yeah. Yeah, that's good. All right. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for coming and uh love to your family and please keep Thank us you. posted. Thank you. We'll do. And Margie, thanks for riding shotgun. It's always lovely to have you. Absolutely. You add so much to these interviews. Thank you. And a shout out to Maven. Thanks, Maven, for doing the show notes and time codes and everything. And just everyone at the Open Stories Foundation, Gerardo and Brooklyn and Julia and the board, Clinton, Carrie, and everyone who helps make all this possible. We couldn't do it without you. So, uh, and finally, thanks to the donors that donate to the Open Stories Foundation. We couldn't do it without you. And if you value this content and you're not currently supporting us financially, we could really use your support. Become a monthly donor. Go to mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button. And um, we'll keep providing this content for as long as there's the support to do it. So uh, be good to each other. Be kind to each other. Uh, thanks for joining us on Mormon Stories. And we'll see you all again very soon. Thanks, everybody.